It's their problem. Oh, perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> all right. Most y'all know I'm Bob, and um, this is the a class that I've done for a million years. Um, and oh, sorry, I got to turn this guy off. Sorry. Sorry, Plant. Your time is. Is up. I'll put you back outside. I know you're just getting warmed up. Um, oh, sorry. Let me take those off of you. So, even before I had the school, I uh, I thought it was important that um, everyone from practitioners to the public get exposed to the idea of our drug interactions. Um, and the reason being, I want like everybody know how to avoid um, problems with it because. Like, yay, I've not had problems with herb drug interactions. I'm really cautious with it. But the reality is, if there is an herb drug interaction and it makes the press, it makes me look bad, even if they're not, if I'm not in any way involved. So I want everyone to be safe because herbs are amazing uh, medicine. And the reality is, especially here in Florida, pretty much everybody's on some sort of medication. And so how do we utilize um, plants in either a positive or negative way? And kind of the second half of this is I like to change when most people say herb drug interactions, they have this very negative response. That's a bad thing. And I want to change the way people perceive that, that there are positive herb drug interactions, just like there's negative herb drug interactions. And uh, one of the things I think that my hope is, since like some of you online, many of you here are my students, and the goal is ultimately not that it's an us against them, but the reality is that if we're able to work in conjunction with the, the, the dominant medical community, um, that we can actually utilize these herbs working with doctors and nurse practitioners and so forth to reduce harm from overprescribed medications or high dose medications. And so ultimately we should be able to work together to prevent medical errors and be safer and end up with better outcomes. So that's kind of the goal. Um, and it's funny, and I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the short version of this, but uh, way, I don't know, a really long time ago, well over 25 years ago, when I ran away to acupuncture school, um, I really went there for the diagnostics. Um, license is nice, whatever. Um, but I've always wanted to be an herbalist. I've always practiced as an herbalist. And, you know, although I do still put sharp objects in people, the reality is the bulk of my practice is herbal medicine. And what I found was even in the acupuncture school where at least a third of our training was in herbal medicine and formulation that even in our student clinic there, it wasn't being utilized enough. And I really just kind of talked to the teachers. I talked to the, the patients there. And I was like, what's the holdup here? This is, all of our teachers were telling us, this is the most powerful medicine we have. And um, it was fear. It was a lack of knowledge. It was fear. And that people were afraid that because they're on a medication, um, that somehow we couldn't utilize that medicine. And so I had already been studying Western herbal medicine for, for a million years prior to that. And I knew that, yes, there are some risks of taking herbs and drugs together. Uh, without a doubt, we can't ignore those and pretend that it's not a problem. Um, the reality is there's not a lot of research and we'll kind of explore that a little bit here in a minute. And so I kind of like that first year in school, uh, I made it like, all right, I need to change uh, the education status for everybody, not just the acupuncturist, not just the herbalist. Um, and ensure that we're approaching this from a positive way. And it's funny, I started out in the same thing that most of us say negative things when we think of drug interactions. And so it was probably about 10, maybe 15 years ago that I really started to explore this idea of like, no, we should be doing this intentionally using herbs and drugs together um, to minimize the side effects of the medications. And so I've really started to shift my focus. And yes, we have to always keep up on uh, current research, current potential issues, new medications come out every freaking day and it's next to impossible to keep up with them um, for, for us and the doctors. <laughs> and, and so I really tried to shift my approach to all of this and looking at the positive outcomes that we can have of using these two together. So. Um, we're going to make sure that I spend a little bit of that time. And for y'all, you're going to get like the entire day of this concept. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's funny. 
so whenever I go to a conference, sometimes I take classes, sometimes I don't. It's just cooler people, and they're usually in nice locations. I get to go hiking in the woods and mountains and stuff. But the reality, any time that there is an herb drug interaction class, um, I make a point, no matter who's teaching it, I always make it a point to go to that class because it's oftentimes the new trends, the new research. Um, and somebody will always have an approach that I'm not familiar with. You know, one of the, if time allowing, one of the last things we'll talk about is something that it was at a conference that somebody presented on this. And I was like, this is brilliant. Um, and, and I, one of the things I, I teach all the students is like, don't believe anything any of us say, um, like find, you know, two or three independent resources to anything that sounds a little shady. Um, and so this was somebody I respected greatly, uh, Thomas Easley. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go back and look at PubMed and find whether or not he's telling me uh, the truth or not. And I'm like, huh, I'll be darned, there's even more than he said. Uh, so we'll, we'll have some fun exploring that. So, and, Pardon these just kind of bullet points on all of this, but I want to explore a, a couple of these aspects and we're gonna go into to depth on each one of these a little bit. Um, but as a general rule, man, I got a gang on here. Ah. <laughs> Y'all can't see it. There's like, oh my God, it's overwhelming. Um, but we're gonna explore each one of these and no matter where you are in, in the realm, whether you're somebody who's hitting up the health food store and getting supplements or herbs, uh, or whether you're a student or a practitioner, my goal is to not baffle you with a bunch of biochemistry that's, I won't say meaningless, but uh, it kind of is, but really look at a practical way that we can use this in our day-to-day -day uses and, and do it safely. Um, it, it's funny, this was, I was probably about 15, 10, 15 years ago. And I, I'm bad with time. So, you know, y'all know I don't have any concept whatsoever of time um, because I never let my students pee or like go to eat or anything. <laughs> but I got really intimidated. I was teaching this class. Uh, it was our old location. And um, these folks emailed me and said, hey, we just graduated for phar pharmacy school, which is a PhD, right? Every pharmacist that you know is a PhD. Uh, and... Um, we are so excited to see this class. We're gonna to come to your class. And I was like, oh my God, these guys are gonna sharpshoot me. I, I was like, I don't know, P450, C, Y, that, that, that. I was like, like, okay, I gotta like really brush up on my details, my biochemistry. And I said something about the, these, you know, basically it was the pathways that er, drugs and herbs compete in, in, the, in the body in general. And they're like, don't worry, we don't understand that crap either. So I say, I felt so much better. They're like, they learned it, they passed the test. And so, you know, I'm going to try to keep it off of that train and keep it in the practical uh, arena on all of this. And, and it's funny, um, you know, for I'm sure for some of you who are, who are online here and, and here, I gave my like 20 minute version of this at uh, Herb Day that we had. God, was that just last week? Mm -hmm. That's frightening to think that was only like six days ago. Um, and really the hope was that people who were really interested would come to this so that I, I can talk a little slower and go into a little bit more depth and get people thinking about this process and how we can be safe in the, in, in the realm. Um, one of the biggest things, and this continues to be a huge issue, herbalists say funny words. Um, the, oops. So Western herbalists, we use languages like alterative and enzyolytic and like that's like 1700s language it's insane and most doctors are going to look at us like we got three heads if we start using that language um and then in both chinese ayurvedic western honestly every traditional cultures herbal medicine we start saying things like yin and yang or hot and cold wet and dry and we're describing diseases based on an energetic system and we, you know, in, in many of them, if we say the liver in Chinese, we don't actually mean your physical liver. We're actually talking about this thousand year old concept of it that has more to do with menstruation and mental emotional health and has reflected in your eyes, and your tendons. And so an MD or a nurse or a nurse practitioner someone looks at us like, I don't know what the heck you're talking about, but that has nothing to do with that. And, and so I used the term a few minutes ago about dominant medicine. And um, 
David Winston, uh, my, my herbalist man crush. Uh, he, when I would go to a ceremony or when he would do lectures out, he always talked about dominant culture, that the Native Americans that were here in the United States used to be the dominant culture here. And when the Europeans came over, the native people here were no longer the dominant culture by the late 1800s or so forth. And, and so I kind of really like that concept. It's, it's not that someone is destroyed or, or like each one had its time and place of dominance. And so herbalists were the dominant medicine for thousands of years. And we see around the early 1800s, herbalism started to wane. We started to look at chemical extractions of the plants. And then by the time we were looking at the 1900s, now we're getting synthetic chemicals and so forth. They were the dominant medicine and herbalism became second fiddle. And that's fine when the zombie apocalypse comes, we're going to be the dominant medicine again. So, you know, keep studying. Um, and, and until that time, before the zombie apocalypse, it would be foolish of us to expect the medical community to learn our language, to find out what an alternative is and whether that's safe with certain medica medications. I don't expect them to start learning about doshas or yin, yin deficiency or yang deficiency and what that might look like. So the reality is we need to learn the language of Western medicine because they are the dominant culture. And we need to become better versed in our ability to communicate our thoughts through their language um, so that A, they think we have half a brain and B, that we can better communicate with them their concerns and what we're trying to accomplish. And so, you know, learning any foreign language, medicine is a foreign language. Uh, and, and so it is our job to make sure that we do that. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, in Chinese medicine, we talk about blood movers. The reality is that sounds like it might be a blood thinner, but it's not. Well, sometimes it is. Uh, I, I had a interesting, we had somebody came into student clinic a while back. I'll, I'll pretend that I don't know what the time frame is. And um, she had had as a child, uh, I think it was rheumatic fever. And so at a very early age, there was some physical heart damage and she was put on blood thinners like Coumadin from the time she was like 10 or 12 years old. And by the time she was in her forties, she was having to, you know, if you're on Coumadin, you're basically going in and getting your clotting time, your INR tested like every couple of weeks to make sure they don't need to adjust it up or down. And so at some point they were just like, you know, more than all of the uh, hematologists do here, they actually got her her own machine to test her clotting time and said, you call us and they bring her in every couple of months just to make sure she was doing it right. And she came to us, the, you know, Coumadin will keep your blood from clotting, which is good. You won't die from a stroke. But the reality is the side effects of Coumadin are kind of rough that, you know, fatigue being the one of the worst ones. And this was a very active woman. And now she was getting into her sixties. She was like, I'm having a hard time walking, you know, one block that I have to stop and rest. And she was like, is there any way you can use herbs to counteract some of the side effects of the Coumadin? And I was like, I have no idea. So can we put a blood thinning herb into a formula so that she doesn't need as much Coumadin and she's able to adjust her dosing. So we got to do this magical thing that I don't think a lot of people get to do is put her on an herb that we think might actually thin the blood and she could daily check her clotting time in order to tell us whether it did or not. And so we found out that there was a number of herbs that the books all report as changing the clotting time did not. And ones that weren't reported sometimes did. And all of them in this same general blood moving category, which is the Chinese class this week. Uh, <laughs> and, and so it's one of those things where it takes a couple of weeks to find out. And, you know, that's one of the approaches, and we'll talk about it later, is to slowly ramp up and then work with an MD or some lab or to make sure that we're not affecting somebody adversely or allowing for those medications to be altered. You know, ultimately garlic thins the blood. So next time you go for pasta dinner, like what's that doing? You know, if you're on a blood thinner, is it gonna kill you? Probably not, maybe. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's a lot of challenges and it is a never ending um, learning curve. The other thing is I'm not a pharmacist. 
I'm an herbalist, I'm an acupuncturist. Um, so I have to learn a lot about pharmacology. We'll touch on a few words as we go through here. Um, and I hate to say it, pharmacologists are not herbalists. And so they don't really understand what we do. You know, it's funny, I, um, usually twice a year, I go over to St. Pete College and teach at the nursing program there. And they have a, uh, it used to be an elective, I think it's a required class now. Um, and it is in that class, it's more about um, different cultures and how nursing has to approach certain cultures uniquely and to be respectful of the cultures. And it's like awesome class. And so part of that was learning about the herbs that might be utilized that they feel comfortable talking about or not. And in that textbook that goes with that class, they have like 10 herbs and things like Kava Kava and St. John's Wort and Echinacea and a couple of others. And I, they were like, so what do you think about this? And I read it and I was, I was horrified. I was horrified at what they were being taught. It was completely wrong. Um, and, and I shouldn't say that, not completely wrong. Things like St. John's Wort, there are real concerns. And it basically made them terrified of herbal medicine and it took some of the you know in some cases very rare herbs and uh ultimately sometimes ones that were not commonly used Ooh, and i so apologize um i'm gonna say uh, it's hard for me to monitor the chat trisha i think is i just noticed like oh crap i'm not looking at the chat um, so feel free if any of you have like a burning question, feel free to shout it out or Trisha or I will try to um, jump in there and, and read it out for you. Um, so the reality is we, for all of us, we only know what we know until we know something different, you know, until, you know, the MDs and the nurses are exposed to a greater idea and taught not to fear our stuff. Literally, they're terrified of herbal medicine. Um, and generally they won't stop you from eating a salad, which is loaded with herbs or a cup of tea. And a cup of tea is literally the drug that's in it is scheduled by the DEA. Caffeine is literally a scheduled drug. Not the same as heroin, but it's up there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so like the reality is some things are okay with, they're all sitting there throwing back coffee in class. I promise <laughs> as am I. And they're not taught to fear that. And so it, it is really our job to educate as many people as we can about this concept. Um, we're going to talk about quality control quite a bit. And um, one of the things that I find most of the adverse events associated with both nutraceuticals, vitamins and minerals and supplements and herbs is because of poor quality control. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to play with that a little bit. And it is what causes the greatest confusion is if we don't know what's in a supplement and it's not verifiable and something weird happens, then we're just like, we don't know what to blame at all. Um, and, and so that's one of the things where we can have an impact. You guys as students um, in student clinic, like it is normal for me to open up capsules and taste them because it's the only way we can tell. You know, I don't have a laboratory at my fingertips to play with stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm going to keep going here because we're going to cover all of these a little bit of depth. And so, I don't really like a phar pharmacodynamics and pharma pharmacokinetics. Boy, it's hard to talk at the end of the day. <laughs> um, are really five dollar words that are really cool. It's easier to say PD or PK because nobody wants to use that $5 word there. And usually what we're talking about when we're talking, when we're watching a commercial on TV about a new medication, um, when we're talking to our doctor who's prescribing medication, we're talking about its effect on the body. That's This drug is going to lower your blood pressure. So that's the pharmacodynamics. But how it goes through the body, what route does it get processed into the body, absorbed and excreted through the body, is more about um, where we're going to run into herb-drug interactions sometimes. And so we sometimes have to look at, you know, a little bit more biochemistry with that to understand it. And yet, uh, going through the PDR, the physician's desk reference, or just going online and like 
ooh, I wonder what kind of research is out there on this drug. And you literally go to the company's website, you go to the doctor's site, you're allowed. You don't need to like show your credentials. You just use bigger words and more information that's not necessary for the general public, but fascinating for nosy people like me. And there's literally a, I, I, I won't give you a percentage, but too often I get to those sites and I read that, it will literally say, we have no idea why this drug works. It does. It does what it says, but we don't know why. We don't know how it happens through the body. It's magic. Okay, they don't say magic. But... <laughs> and, and that's a little frightening that they've created a medication that has side effects, also known as effects. Um, it also does what they say it's going to do, but they don't really know why. And that's a little creepy. So we have to do the best we can to understand the PK and we're gonna talk about some really basic ways that we can minimize how an herb may affect how that drug is processed and eliminated out of the body. So there's a, a couple things that we need to, to think about is there's no one size fits all in the realm of medication. There's no one size fits all in the realm of herbalism. And certainly when we start to think about their interaction with each other, we have to look at this on a case by case basis because everybody's uniquely different. And one of the hardest things, you know, and not to beat up on, um, you know, health food stores, like one of my graduates works the supplement aisle there and freaking smart as can be. Um, but the reality is, what's the difference between what do you got for high blood pressure? Here's some magnesium with no history or minimal history. And one of you all sitting there spending an hour and a half to two hours going through an entire medical history um, with a client. And so there's a big difference on how well we can choose herbs or supplements and how well we can control the safety of that. And we can take in more accounts uh, if we're doing a full medical history on somebody. So. There, there's some frightening statistics out there. So, you know, we, we can sit there and make fun of the FDA. We can make fun of drug manufacturers and all that. And the reality is, you know, yeah, they're trying to make a buck. And there, there are issues that have arisen over the centuries or the century uh, with how things are approved. But most drugs are fairly safe. Honestly, they're not killing people left and right. Yeah, there's been some issues, but, you know, not a big deal. They research the crap out of a medication before it's approved by the FDA. There are, there is some research of two drugs being used together. There is a couple of studies of four medications being used together. There is big goose egg of more than four medications being used simultaneously, zero. And so they can make some guesses based on the P K, right? How it processes through the body. And so if you're on six medications that all go through a particular pathway in your liver, they're like, ooh, maybe there'll be a reaction. The reality is, A, it's a guess because there's no research. And B, I about guarantee your doctor, your MD, isn't even looking at that. They're just going, here's the right drug. And they're hoping that the pharmacist will pick up if there's going to be an adverse reaction. There is very little long-term studies of a lot of medications. And that's why we see sometimes years after a medication has been approved, that all of a sudden they pull it off the market or they put a black box warning on there because most of the studies are very short-term. Uh, a great example is the acid reflux meds. There are no studies past one year, zero. And I'll resist the temptation to go off on a tangent and a rant on that. So <laughs> y'all have heard these. <laughs> so it, it's really important to understand that everybody is working without a net. The doctors just look better doing it. Uh, <laughs> and oddly enough, there's been some studies overseas that show that when, you know, think about this. So we have a single chemical drug, good research, maybe a little research with two single chemical drugs. Now we have, I don't wanna say how many people are running around with five, six, 10, 12. My record's like 24, 25 medications on a, I think she was maybe 30, 28, 30 years old, which was horrifying and she wouldn't have a child. It took us two years to get her down to like two medications. Um, and she has two young, healthy children now. 
Um, but now we're going to take a plant, like, yay, let's throw some basil into the mix that's made up of thousands of chemicals, like completely unpredictable, right? The research, and again, overseas, we see it in uh, generally countries that have universal health care because plant medicine is super cheap, comparable to drugs, and it's easy to access. So they're always trying to do research on like, is this safe? Is it effective? Even more so, uh, so they don't waste the, that country's money. So what they found was we actually reduced the side effects by adding in the appropriate herb. And again, very limited studies, not long-term, uh, but there are some real benefits to adding something in based on some system. If we just go, echinacea is good for you. No, that doesn't do anything and more likely to cause harm. But if we work on a medical system, if we work on an energetic system, Ayurvedic, Chinese, doesn't matter, um, then it actually reduces the uh, medical errors with that. Just said, friend had 36 meds. Yes, okay, that's a new record. Way to go, Tabitha, 36. <laughs> so think about it, no research over four medications. And that poor woman's, I, it is a guarantee that she's having an adverse reaction to the, some of those medications. Like not even a question, a pharmacist would tell you that. Uh, so any kind of special population, we increase our risk. They're going to change the way their medications and their herbs are processed through the body. So very young children um, and very old are going to have more challenges in breaking down, absorbing and excreting their, uh, their medications and their herbal medications. Also, if we start thinking about really small organisms, think birds, there's not a lot of margin of error on a bird. Same for larger animals because we're using higher doses sometimes. So if we're doing herbal and medication for an elephant versus, you know, Tweety bird, we need to be extra cautious and take extra things into account. Pregnancy is always one of the big terrifying things. It's one of those things where we see plenty of clients with uh, who are pregnant and it's not scary with some basic, um, you know, I hate to say it, research that goes into it. I don't, there's certain things where I don't trust my memory. Pregnancy is one of those. I will always look up my herbs before I give it to somebody who's pregnant. In general, our greatest risk factor is in the first trimester because like breathing is contraindicated in your first trimester. It's like stuff happens. I, I mean, it's a terrible thing, but you know, there are any number of different reasons why somebody may miscarriage in that first trimester. And so we, we do nothing but the most safe things uh, at that time, unless it's, we're doing something to try to save the loss of a, a, of a, a baby. Um, we also have to always be careful with pregnancy uh, with anything that's toxic. So generally, we're going to avoid anything that's toxic, has the potential to harm a fetus because special population, they're tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, <laughs> and if we put something in there that may cause uh, some sort of damage, has a, a cumulative toxicity, that small organism is going to have an easier time being damaged. Um, and it is a general rule, we're going to avoid anything that has downward energy. And that downward energy is things like large doses of magnesium that makes you poop really vigorously. Um, that would be a downward energy. So things that are caustic, purgative, cleanses, anything along those, don't ever do. I don't care what trimester you're in, you don't do it. You're in the sixth trimester. Okay, there's only three. <laughs> um, breastfeeding, it's funny. Uh, breastfeeding is a, a, not so much an herb drug interaction, we're just gonna say an herb reaction. Um, many of our herbs do materialize in the breast milk. Um, and that can be a pro or a con. We can actually give herbs to the infant through the mother. And there, you know, there's a concept that like the body always knows, right? You know, mother nature always goes, knows what's best for us. So don't screw with mother nature, right? I, some of you all remember that commercial from the seven. Uh, <laughs> I don't even remember what commercial that was, but I remember it well. Um, but one of the problems we run into most commonly, again, nothing toxic because that may be passed through the breast milk, is that it will change the flavor of the breast milk and the baby may actually turn away and stop breastfeeding. And that's ultimately the best food for, for a youngin. Uh, so we generally avoid really bitter herbs um, that will oftentimes express through. Uh, one of the ones that I purposely will avoid, um, and it's not the end of the world because 
once you get that out of the system, then it's fine, is asparagus root. And that's the uh, sh uh, shatavri or shatavari, depending on, you know, potato patata. Uh, also tian mendong, both of those are asparagus root, use pretty much the same. Those will often affect the breast milk. Um, and I'm just assuming I have some acupuncture students or acupuncturists on here. So pardon me for throwing Chinese at the folks who have like no idea what I just said. Um, the other thing is we avoid a lot of bitter herbs or a lot of sour herbs. Those can actually dry up the breast milk and not allow it to release properly. So a little bit of bitter is fine, but like the all bitter all the time is oftentimes considered very drying in its nature. And we want to express lots of moisture with that. Um, hereditary crap, good luck with that. It's like, no, there's no way to know that. And so stuff happens. We have to be careful and always be monitoring uh, to watch for any kind of an adverse event. Um, one of the things that I, I uh, knew were on my radar is people have latex allergies uh, or sensitivities. I guess they're not true allergies sometimes. And that can be acquired or gen uh, genetic. And if you are one of those folks who are like, oh no, I hate it when I go to the doctor, they put a Band-Aid on, I'm gonna have this rash that's gonna take forever to heal. Go research all the foods that contain latex. You will be horrified and really good for you. Like things like avocado, freaking phenomenal food, high in latex, kiwis. I know it was a shock for me too. <laughs> and the list is this long. Obviously some things have more than others. Um, and many of our herbs also are late, that are very, very good for you, generally safe, but contain latex. So we have to really have that good uh, history on folks so that we can avoid some pitfalls like that. Um, and then we've always got disease states, like if you have irritable bowel syndrome, if you have Crohn's disease, uh, if you've got um, you know any kind of food sensitivity or outright hereditary allergy, um, it's going to move your drugs out as well as your herbs much quicker. And so we just have to take those things into account. When, or, or yeah, allergic to gluten, uh, celiac disease, anything along those lines. So, so I'm gonna throw more fancy $5 words at you. And oh boy, I see a question there, but I can't, I can't read that far. A lot of it is conversation. Oh, okay, good, I'll ignore that. Yeah. So probably like, forget everything else I said, the most important thing for you to figure out is the concept of narrow therapeutic margin. And that's fancy talk for if you get too much, bad things happen. You don't get enough, bad things happen. So seizure meds is my favorite example. Too much seizure meds will literally kill you. Not enough, you'll have a seizure. And seizures don't usually kill anybody. They can, but it's, it's usually a side effect from like, I was driving a car and I had a seizure. Seizure didn't kill you. The car did when it hit the tree. Um, but the reality is probably the worst part of it is if you have a seizure, you lose your driver's license for three years. And that would suck. You know, like, oh, I, now I can't go to work. Um, so anything where too much or too little, it's not that we can't use herbs, that we have to be extremely cautious because we are going to cause potential harm um, in this process. And so blood thinners, and there are many different types of blood thinners. Um, warfarin, Coumadin is probably in the realm, one of the scarier ones, there's like now third and fourth generation ones that are less scary that they work on a different mechanism that you can start and stop it. They don't require you to monitor your clotting time uh, the way you do with Coumadin, but there are times when you still need to be taking the Coumadin. Um, as a general rule with all of the, well, I shouldn't say that, with some of these, like the, the blood thinners in, with Coumadin, what I recommend is you need to be working with your doctor, start on a subclinical dosage. So whatever the bottle says, do half of that. That's my short answer. And do that about a week before your next time you're getting your clotting time tested. So either the drug gets adjusted or the herbs get adjusted. If you're like, oh crap, like that's way too thin. I'm bruising everywhere. Like maybe that's not the best herb for you. Um, and then you slowly can increase that as the doctors every two weeks continue to test it. And I would say, tell your doctor you're doing that. Even if they tell you like, don't do that. I was like, well, I'm doing it. So you're going to help me. You're going to allow me to kick off. And if they say, well, just die, um, get a new doctor. Literally, I've seen doctors who it's rare. 
but I watched doctors sabotage people who are trying to use natural medicine, like intentionally so. Those doctors need to retire and we need to make the ones who are like, I don't know much about it, but I'm happy to work with you and do it safely. We need to make them rich. Those are really good doctors. And so like, let's, let's, you know, shout their name from the rooftop and make sure that everybody's going to see them. So, um, Protease inhibitors, these are your antivirals and some antivirals are scarier than others. Usually when we're talking about this, we're talking about the um, HIV medications. Um, and, you know, it's funny, usually when we're talking about uh, antivirals, we're literally talking about 20 plus years ago when the medications for HIV were horrendous. And like, which one's worse? Um, nowadays, like, A, they're super effective, um, that folks can continue to live a normal, long, healthy life without really crappy side effects. It's When I was first in practice, um, I literally used to see a lot of folks with HIV. I don't see any anymore because they don't need me. <laughs> so that they they don't need help in trying to address their, their HIV. Um, but the reality is we do need to be careful because the medications are working, minimal side effects, let's not screw that up. As a general rule, unless we're gonna go down the biochemistry route, which would just drive you uh, insane, things that are really, and this is true of all of the medications we're gonna talk about. If it is really bitter or really sour, it will change how that drug is processed through your body. The sour herbs tend to keep the drug in your body longer. The bitter herbs tend to push it out faster. So anything that's like, ooh, don't get your, you know, if you miss a dosage, something scary is going to happen. Literally watch your really bitter and sour herbs. And, you know, we don't want too much of a really powerful thing because it's going to cause harm. It's going to cause side effects. You know, Theoretically, yeah. And, and I mean, I hate to say it, there's like next to no research and we're going to talk about some specific drugs like, oh, hell no. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is there's not a lot of research. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about research. How do we evaluate this crap? Um, immunosuppressants. Um, so immunosuppressants are interesting. Not all immunosuppressants are the same. Um, if you are on uh, an immunosuppressant for an autoimmune disorder, it's crappy to screw that up. You're going to have a rough time. It may cause some damage to your body, but you're not gonna keel over and die the next day. If you are on an immunosuppressant because you've had an organ transplant, that could become life-threatening. So if somebody's on uh, immunosuppressants for organ transplants, I'm going to say, don't try that one at home, kids. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's one that you need to, if your doctor's not willing to work with you, if you're not an experienced herbalist, I just wouldn't do it. Um, and now I'm going to tell you a bad story because I like telling bad stories. Um, I, I've been saying that since day one. And it was the one thing I'm like, yeah, I don't know that you should be working with herbs. Um, uh, you know, somebody's got, you know, was lucky enough to get a kidney, um, like their life will be threatened if they're not able to get it. So a guy came to me, he had kidney transplant. I think he was almost 30 years ago. And the life expectancy of a new organ is a maximum about 30 years. And his function was declining. He was on the transplant list. Um, he did everything perfect. Like he was so like, measuring his water and his protein, everything that could possibly get the maximum benefit out of the kidney. He was on it. This, this man was the healthiest man on the planet, I think, except for he had a bum kidney. And his kidney function was declining. And I think he came to see me like October. I'm, I'm guessing at the date. He was like, I don't want to have to deal with this over the holidays. I got a family. I don't want to ruin the holidays. I haven't told my family that my kidney's tanking. And he was like, can you get me through to like February? I was like, I have no idea. Like I would be lying if I said I could get you through tomorrow. Um, 
And so I was like, you know, this is kind of everything you just told me is country. There are no herbs that I can give you because most of them are immunomodulators, which means it makes your immune system normal when we need it to be suppressed or immune stimulants, which again, then the immune system will go after this foreign body, your kidney. And um, I was like, I'll do my best guess. And I hope I don't screw up and ruin your holidays. You know, it won't kill him. He was actually, he, I think he had already, uh, he was at like the top of the list. And um, I want to say we got him through till like March. And it was one of those things where finding just the right dosage that we improved function without hyperstimulating the immune system. And again, this is where our languaging gets screwed up. So our languaging will fool us in this because this is good for the immune system. The heck does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> does that mean I activate the immune system? Is that which part of the immune system? Is it making the virus or the bacteria or the fungus? Which one weaker? Is it making it available? Like, unfortunately, we don't really know. There's not a lot of research out there. So we're guessing sometimes and we're looking at history on this. Um, chemotherapy, and again, there's different types of chemotherapy. Sometimes they're used for things like autoimmune disorders where I'm less concerned. And when somebody's going through some sort of cancer treatment, chemotherapy, without a doubt, narrow therapeutic margin, um, too much chemo does really bad things like kill you. Um, not enough does really bad things like doesn't kill your cancer. And so we have to be extremely cautious. My short answer is don't do herbs with chemo. Like, and I'm gonna to add to that, and, and this is going to maybe make some people frustrated. Don't juice with chemo. Because ultimately chemotherapy works, I'm gonna say much of the time. If we push the chemo out, I guarantee it won't work. And so I know people who are doing flushes and cleanses and they're juicing to clear all of this stuff out. We don't want to change the amount of time that that stuff's in us. And I've had more than one person who's very proud that they went through their chemotherapy juicing the entire time and they did it with no side effects. I'm here to tell you, if you do chemo, you're supposed to have side effects. And so if you didn't, that means you pushed the chemo out and it didn't do its job. And in just about every case that I was able to follow up on, the cancer came back. So please, please, please don't make major changes if you're going through that. And this is a big deal one, never bitter or sour herbs. Many, many, many of our, med our herbs interfere with chemotherapy. And so we support people through that, usually with food, um, and we don't cleanse the liver or do any kind of cleansy, purgy anything. <laughs> we'll do bad things. Um, seizure meds, probably one of the scarier things to work with. As I said, you lose your driver's license. It's the biggest scary. That said, you have to be very cautious. Again, slowly moving it up as we um, reduce the meds. In most cases, what I've got is people who, most people are like, they don't like their Caesar meds, but if they're working, they're fine. You know, they, they suck, they have side effects and that stinks. There are way too many cases in student clinic. We had a, a gentleman many years ago came in for seizures and we're like, well, are you on meds? He's like, I can't afford them. If somebody doesn't have health insurance. They're really expensive. And to see a specialist in it to even prescribe them, it's really expensive. And it, this is a terrible thing. Most people, was, this isn't always true, but in many types of seizures is a trigger. And so one of my questions always is, well, what's your trigger for your seizures? You know, some people it's their menses. In his case, it was like alcohol. I was like, I got the perfect cure for you. Stop freaking drinking. <laughs> And uh, I won't, I, I don't remember whether we helped him or not, because not everybody wants to hear that. Um, but in the case of like, if there is a menses related one, you can't just stop that. Um, so there are herbs that can help with seizures, but the act of trying to reduce your seizure medication can frequently cause a seizure. Um, and some seizure medications are used not for seizures, but other things like nerve pain and so forth. 
Um, and we always have to be careful because if we push that out of the body, it can trigger a seizure, even if you don't have seizures. So that's one that we move, no sudden movements with that. And with all of this, and I have a, another slide on here that's even more detailed. This is like, I don't like put my foot down, but I practice this and I, I will do some crazy stuff. You know, as long as it's important consent with my client, do not use St. John's Ward internally if you're on any medication to include birth control. Any over-the-counter medication, it is likely to interfere. St. John's wort, according to the biochemistry of it, interferes with half of all prescription medications. Like, not even a question. Um, and so there's conflicting research. And, you know, there's a herbalist out of England who is like, I can find a piece of research that says the opposite of everything I'm going to say. And I was just like, so just don't do it. There's lots of other great herbs out there that are very safe. Um, that said, St. John's Word is a really safe herb as long as you're not on medications. Um, it is not really for depression. Um, a, it's phenomenal for nerve stuff. Um, I'm purposely vague because it's good for nerve stuff. Anything from frazzled nerves to neuropathy to nerve pain to sciatica, it can be helpful. And rather than saying it's good for depression, it's more for melancholia. It's uh, Eeyore syndrome. <sighs> Everything sucks. It's better for that. Um, and, and that's going to come up again when we start talking about the, um, uh, well, okay, it's here. And for any of you Chinese medicine folks, that's in your Medica. Uh, we never talk about it. I disagree with what the Chinese books say the energetics of this herb are. They say it's really cold because it happens to also be antiviral. Um, but if you've ever seen St. John's, uh, St. John's word grow. It's this bright, shiny, brilliant yellow flower. Um, the, uh, the, when we make an oil extraction of it, it's this rich red color to it. Nothing about that makes me think cold. Um, so I think that's more of a speaking to its action as an antiviral specifically. Uh, and now that I said like, be afraid of everything St. John's word, Topically, it is 100% safe. There are no herb drug interactions with St. John's wort oil topically, and we are not concerned with uh, herb drug interactions with that. I've given that to every, everybody with anything you could possibly imagine. And um, ignore the fancy $5 words there. That's for the very chemistry minded. That's there for y'all. Um, what I'm going to say is, uh, oh God, that... <laughs> For anybody who actually cares what CYP 450, blah, 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 it's some super category of enzymic uh, cytokine, uh, uh, bleh, forget it. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Uh, Someone asked, is it okay to use um, St. John's work topic for sciatic? Yes, 100%. Don't care about meds. Yeah. It, and will it cure sciatica? Sometimes. You know, it just kind of depends. Yeah. As a and they were talking about St. John's work and mm -hmm. adding Artemisia to it and mm -hmm. um, it would absorb deeper for sciatica. I would believe that, yeah. With the so they were adding Artemisia, uh, probably mugwort or something yeah. like that, mugwort's warming, um, that that will help drive it deeper. And I, I can go off on a crazy tangent on that. I'll resist the temptation. Mm -hmm. We can use things like mock combustion for the, the Chinese herbalist where it's mugwort. Uh, burnt over it and will actually drive things in. I frequently do that for poultices and things like that. Um, oh, this is gibberish. But what I'm going to say is somewhere there's some uh, some research, uh, you know, back in the 70s, they are like, St. John's works for depression. And so all of the companies that made SSRIs and, and sort of like, no, it's not. You have to take drugs for that. And so we're going to prove it doesn't work. And so they, and this is the way most of the research is done, unfortunately, for herbs. They look for the unique chemical that's in there. They isolate it and they test that against the medication because that works better. It's easier to control a simical, single chemical for testing and do a comparison. And um, it failed. So they looked at hypericin, a unique chemical that's in uh, St. John's work, and it 
didn't do as well as the SSRIs. And we're like, well, we never said the chemical did anything. We said the plant does. And so just because something is the primary, and I'm going to say marker compound to ensure you have the right uh, plant, doesn't mean it's an active constituent. Um, and there, there's been probably more studies on St. John's work than anything else. And that's why we know they're like, oh crap, don't, don't be messing with this one with any of your medications. Um, the, they tried to test it against uh, moderate to severe depression and it failed, but then everything fails against moderate to severe depression. So most of your SSRIs, your SNRIs and St. John's work is more effective to mild to moderate. Um, when they finally, I think it was in the early 80s, somebody finally said, let's try the plant. Um, it actually did slightly better than the prescription medication. At a, It's a weed, literally, that grows throughout the eastern seaboard. And so they didn't put that one at the rooftop because it's too inexpensive. And it was just as effective without a lot of the side effects, as long as you weren't on prescription meds. And I, I, I'm going to beat that into everybody's head. Um, yeah, we're going to skip all that. That's biochemistry. We don't have time for that. <laughs> That's advanced. So I say use with caution this other big categories, because how do we, you know, one of the things that they say when we're talking about our drug interactions, we see that a lot of the uh, MDs and pharmacists say, may enhance the effects of your medication. And we're like, okay, so now you're saying that like this herb actually does stuff, right? Herbs don't work. Well, unless you're taking it with a medication, then it's really strong. So which one is it? <laughs> and, and so the reality is they do do stuff. And that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. And diabetes is my, my favorite example of this. So if you're a diabetic, and I'm going to use type two because that's the easier one to work with. And you were taking medication, you're taking some metformin, and you're controlling your diet through diet and exercise, you've eliminated your refined carbohydrates and your sugars, and you're like rocking it. Then honestly, you're good. Don't change anything. Like you can maybe at some point even get off of that medication. But if you're less than perfect, if a year's gone by and you've tried, diet and exercise and you're not having success and your blood sugar hasn't come down, you're getting the side effects of elevated blood sugar. And they're about to put you on is it Genuvia or whatever, you know, they'll start adding more and more medications onto there. Um, the herbs can have a benefit. So if your blood sugar is not being well controlled with your medication and you take something, bitter melons, one of my favorite ones to talk about, and you take that, it will bring your blood sugar down. Not even a question. It will bring it down. If your blood sugar was controlled and you take bitter melon, your blood sugar will go too low. So low blood sugar is just as dangerous as high blood sugar. So, you know, like my short answer is if you drop your blood sugar too low, you're going to get dizzy and pass out and break a hip. That would be bad. But if your blood sugar is too high, even with medication and you take it, it will normalize your blood sugar. So each one of these categories can be a pro or a con. And so most medications, you know, we, we've all made fun of that drug commercial you see on TV where they, you know, sim, you know, side effects may include, you know, numbness, vomiting, you know, brains flying out of your ears, you know, growing a third head out of your, your shoulders. Like, you know, like that's horrifying. And you know what? Those are really rare. Those don't happen a lot. It, it's like a tenth of a percent of the people who see these horrible things. And so where the problem comes with most medications is when they start hitting the ceiling. Like there's the low therapeutic dosage and then there's the maximum therapeutic dosage. Those side effects are up here in that you know, top end range. So if we can use herbs to keep us having to increase our dosage or medication and keep it at the lowest therapeutic range, we have really good success. Low risks of adverse events from the medication and we have to stabilize, stabilize our blood sugar and our blood pressure. High blood sugar, high blood pressure will kill you. So using these two to avoid the adverse defense that we see with certain medications and still keeping our stuff completely under control. So we just have to be careful. So somebody who has diabetes needs to monitor their blood sugar. 
And especially if they're adding in a supplement, especially if they're adding in an herb to help control their blood sugar. Same is true of blood pressure, same is true of antidepressants, anti-anxieties, um, yeah, blood thinners, we talked about those already, um, and diuretics. The problem comes when we don't pay attention. We don't monitor it. And so this one, I always say it's like, it's good or bad. It's a positive or a negative herb drug interaction with this. So working with your doctor becomes vital on this one. Good question online. Yo -yo. Um, wouldn't bitter melon move the metformin out of your body faster or does the bitter concept not apply? Um, it could. And, and yeah, because bitter melon is really bitter. Um, I, I'll give you all a funny story. So if somebody's uh, blood sugar is well controlled, I'd be like, don't worry about it. But I had this woman, uh, this was eh, probably 10 years ago, maybe a little less. Um, this woman was in her 90s. Uh, she emigrated from Cuba, I think in the 50s, before Fidel had taken over. It was still, uh, Batista was still in control of Cuba. And um, she came in for the neuropathy, the numbness in her feet due to her diabetes. And she had really scary looking feet that I was like, Ugh, they're going to cut these off soon. Like if she got one bad cut in there, it was like, and she, she didn't want my herbs. She just wanted acupuncture and she'd heard acupuncture would help. And um, she didn't speak any English that I know of. So she would always have to bring her daughter in to, to translate for me. And, um, and you know, if you get bored, I have a 12 part TV series in uh, Ecuador, all over Spanish speaking, South America, Central America, and I don't speak Spanish, I'm subtitled. So uh, for those of you who speak Spanish, you'll get way more out of the, the thing, but it's on NT TV. Um, so after like three or four sessions, like, and I was taking St. John's Wort and I was massaging her feet at the end of everything. And I honestly, I was like, I'm not doing you any good. I think she was just coming in and she was paying me a lot of money to massage her feet for her. But, you know, I was like, I don't think your neuropathy is any better. You're not telling me there's any improvement. And um, uh, some of you know, I, I grew up in the Bahamas in the Out Islands, Navico. And so I, I frequently will utilize a lot of the herbs that are either grow locally here or come from the Caribbean. And um, so I really either I was going to tell her like, you know, you're welcome to keep scheduling, but don't you don't need to come back because you're not going to get any better. Um, or I need to talk you into herbs. And so I, I'm always like, I couldn't believe that it was an, she was adverse to herbs. I think she was just adverse to Chinese herbs. And so I, I asked her a little bit about where she grew up in Cuba. It was like city or country is sometimes the way I ask it. And so, especially if we're talking back in the fifties, you know, if you were in the city, you probably just had regular doctors. But if you were lived in the country, you had no access to MDs in many, many countries. Uh, and so I was like, she lives, I've lived in the country, in the mountains. If you don't know it, Cuba is a very mountainous country. There's, there's coastal places, but there, there's some really not huge mountains, but decent ones. And I was like, so did your, your mom or your grandma or anybody use herbs for you? And she was like, my, uh, my mother was considered an herbalist. And I was like, so if I gave you an herb from, that your mother would have given you, that it comes from Cuba, um, would you do it? And she kind of like, the hell is this kid know <laughs> about herbs from Cuba, right? And, and it's, it's funny, um, the bitter melon uh, has, has many names, it's the herb with many names. Um, and so we see it called Kundemur, uh, we see it called Surasi, and like whether you're in Haiti, you just, if you say it with a French accent, then they know what you said. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and I was like, it's either called Surasi or it's called Kundemur. In Puerto Rico, they call it Kundemur. And she, and then I got a picture of it all. I printed it off the internet. I was like, this. And she's like, I know that plant. And her daughter, uh, she was like, I just, dragged all that stuff off my fence and threw it away. I was like, well, go find some more. And I literally pulled some off the back fence of the clinic and said, here, go find this at home. You can use it dried or fresh. And um, I was like, you need three leaves a day. And she was like, but it tastes terrible. I like, and she was all about the guava jelly. She was fanatic. I was like, what are you going to do? Tell her she can have guava jelly. She's 90 something. Uh, and so I was like, I don't care if you wrap it in rice and guava jelly. Like, I need you to get this in there. And she came back a few weeks later. Her feet looked better. Her blood sugars had normalized. She was still taking her medication, I think. <laughs> 
And, and so sometimes, yeah, it will potentially have an interaction. Monitoring your blood sugar is important, but when it's out of control, sometimes we can use the herbs to actually literally bring it into control, but it's always about consistency. Um, you know, if you don't take your prescription medications, guess what? They don't work. If you don't take your herbal prescription, they don't work either. They don't do any good in the, in the bottle, they are inside your belly. Uh, and in the case of this gross, nasty herb, um, it can be a challenge. So the, the same is true of all of these. Too high of blood pressure or too low blood pressure, both of those are really bad. Um, antidepressants, uh, in the case of antidepressants, our biggest risk is we see, especially when people are on multiple antidepressants um, or you know combination of antidepressants and anxieties, um, the herbs that are in a similar function will have a multiplier effect. And so if your prescription meds are making you tired and maybe like, I'm falling asleep at the wheel, I can't, you know, I know zest for life. Frequently, if we add herbs with that same effect and keep our medications the same, they will increase that uh, side effect of sleepiness or uh, lack of motivation and so forth. So um, it, you, oh Lordy, I'm getting in trouble now. How does magnesium affect blood pressure? And is there a specific type they should or should not take if they are on blood pressure medication? So magnesium does everything. There's so many reasons for um, high blood pressure, anything from stress um, to, you know, it's funny when we talk energetics, we talk about intense condition. And so uh, when everything in somebody's body is contracted, like the shoulders are up, all of this, your oftentimes your blood vessels are the same way. They're literally contracted and they're not allowing for that loop loop as the heart beats because your, your blood vessels are supposed to be flexible. Um, and magnesium, and we also see other things besides just hypertension. We see things like tachycardia, uh, where the, the heart's not keeping, it's either too fast a rhythm or an irregular uh, heartbeat. That sometimes, sometimes a mineral deficiency uh, is the cause of that. And so we find an interesting thing. Magnesium is one of the more common minerals that is depleted in our soil ever since the dust bowl yay um and so we literally when we're looking at uh fertilizer one of the things that we add to the soil is magnesium uh to your plants to make sure that they thrive that you get yellowing of the leaf if there's not enough magnesium um so if we're eating foods that is depleted of magnesium then our body is depleted of magnesium if we can't get it from our food where the heck we don't magically get it out of the air um, and so I find that it is one of the more common deficiencies, nutritional deficiencies that we see in folks. And I kind of look for um, a, a complex of symptoms. It is helpful for constipation. And in that way, it's kind of boring. If you have, you know, uh, your, your intestines are semi-permeable membranes, i.e. stuff goes in and out of the membrane. So if I got too much of uh, a mineral on one side and not enough on the other side, the body will take water from outside the bowel and put it in the bowel and moves the poop out with gusto. Um, so it, usually magnesium oxide is better if it's just constipation, but I look for constipation, insomnia, borderline or high uh, blood sugar and borderline or high blood pressure. And I don't think I said insomnia and insomnia. <laughs> if you have all or many of those symptoms, magnesium is magical. The magic is in the form of magnesium. Uh, and so magnesium oxide is the cheapest and the least absorbable. So magnesium oxide generally is only good for uh, a poop mover and is also the most inexpensive. So it's a way to check the quality control of your products. If you're taking a, 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 a multivitamin or some supplement that has magnesium as one of the main ingredients and it only has magnesium oxide in there, chances are all of the other products in there are only the cheapest product. Magnesium glycinate is the most absorbable and the most expensive. <laughs> 
and has the least effect on the bowels. So if you're like, yeah, well, my poop is normal to loose. By the way, all I do is talk about poop and menses all day long. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, you know, over dinner, whatever. Um, and so if you've already got normal stools, but tend towards loose, then magnesium glycinate is oftentimes uh, a, a good choice, but it's pricey. If you're like, eh, I poop, it's, you know, if, if I travel, I get a little constipated and the blood pressure's creeping up, the blood sugar's starting like walking that 99, 98 line or crossed over the line. Um, you're getting some muscle cramps, you have a hard time getting to sleep, you feel stressed all the time. Magnesium citrates, a moderate cost, um, many different brands out there. It's kind of middle of the road of absorbable and kind of does all of it well. Um, and so it's a very, very easy way to effectively use a supplement to supplement a nutritional deficiency that's very common, safe for children. Um, and I usually say, follow whatever it says, whatever your product is, follow the directions on that. If you get loose stools, cut back, you took too much. To bow tolerance. I think I answered that question. <laughs> it was my usual rant. <laughs> Does anybody else <laughs> um, that, uh, what else? Oh, antidepressants. Yes. Um, so has a multiplying effect of oftentimes that side effect. Um, and antidepressants suck because they're hard to get off of once you're established on them. So that can be, depending on the antidepressant, it can be really challenging. It doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to monitor people who are like, if they come in, you know, a couple of weeks later and they're going, I'm exhausted. And they didn't say that before. It's like, oh, something got to give. So you might back off of any of those herbs that are nervines, antidepressant, anti-anxiety kind of herbs. Um, it's funny. Uh, and barbiturates is a rough category of herbs, uh, herbs of medications. <laughs> we don't have barbiturate medic uh, herbs. <laughs> Um, they're really hard to get off of. Unfortunately, they're still utilized probably too much. And um, usually when somebody's coming to, to see us, they're trying to get off of their barbiturates. Um, things like, I think clonopin's technically a barbiturate. They're, they're in that realm. Um, and it's really hard. It can be life-threatening to come off of those, especially if they just stop taking them. Literally, that can kill you. Um, so a lot of times we're working hopefully with an MD as they uh, titrate or dose slowly off and using herbs to work on getting the symptoms, uh, uh, you know, get them through those withdrawal symptoms easily. For anybody trying to get off of any of these category of medications, you have to fix the underlying issue first. If you have anxiety, and there are many, many, many reasons for anxiety, magnesium deficiency being one, anemia being one, um, a lot, sorry, crazy Chinese or energetic language, a lot of heat in the body, all of those can cause anxiety. So if you don't fix the underlying issue, you're going to have a hard time trying to get off of the medication. And then the issue is still there that you were taking the medication for. And so we have to fix the issue before we start to get people to taper off working with their MD. Then we talked blood thinners to death. Um, diuretics, um, diuretics, short-term, fine. Um, Long-term and high dosing of diuretics can cause issues to the physical kidney um, and other interesting, sometimes they can screw with the liver occasionally. In a very mild uh, accumulation of fluids in the body, the herbs work great. But somebody who's showing up with accumulation of water in their body should get evaluated by their MD. MDs are really important. Um, they're able to see stuff. I can't look at you and see what's going on inside your guts. Um, so I, I always encourage, I don't care how awesome an herbalist you are, and because it's not the zombie apocalypse yet, Utilize the blood work of your doctors, the imaging of your doctors. It can be really, really helpful for understanding like, hey, you got those swelling ankles because you're in kidney failure. I can't look at you and tell you that. Um, in which case that's scary and we need to address it from many different ways. 
I always say the MDs are phenomenal at uh, what's called heroic medicine. Like you get hit by a truck. Oh my God, I want all the doctors. I want all the drugs and I want all the surgeons. They will save your life. And then in the long-term recovery care, care they may kill you. Uh, <laughs> and so for chronic disease, they're not as good. Um, they're not set up to take these multi-system chronic diseases and try to understand them because they look at a microcosm instead of a macrocosm. And so herbalists of many traditions, it doesn't matter whether we're Nani Tibbs or Persian medicine or Celtic medicine or whatever, like they tend to look at the bigger picture of things and look at the longer term. How do we change people's behaviors and thought patterns and use nature in order to supplement uh, what's going on to correct an imbalance. And blood work can help us verify some of that things because magnesium deficiency was not common 500 years ago. So we wouldn't necessarily have a symptom pattern to address that um, because we hadn't had the dust bowl yet. So, um, with diuretics and like, yes, there's lots of cool things for it. One of my favorite diuretics is celery. And so when somebody's like on a medication, the doctor's monitoring their kidney function or whatever function. Um, and it's like, they're not quite ready to go up to the next dosage of medication. Um, I literally tell people three stalks of celery a day. And that's, will keep them going pretty well. It's a wonderful potassium sparing diuretic celery. Um, stronger celery seed or celery root. Um, but why wouldn't we just go to Publix and get some organic celery and just eat it? and um, it will work just fine for a mild case or when you're already on medications and need more. Yo. Talk at me, Melody. Hi. Okay, yeah, quick question about the um, magnesium. So yeah. is there a problem taking magnesium with high blood pressure medication? Um, not with the medication ex itself, but... And there's always a but, isn't there? Um, it will lower your blood pressure. And so the medication may need to be uh, altered by the MD because magnesium is really good at lowering your blood pressure. Um, so if your blood pressure is being controlled, and so it's like, yay, it's perfect. It's 120 over 80. Here, have some magnesium. Now it's 90 over 40. You're going to have a problem. So Taking, if you're going to add one thing into your regimen of stuff, it's important that like, no, take your blood pressure every day. And um, ideally working with your doctor to say, hey, why don't we try a half dosage? You're taking that every other day. Different medications, we can taper off of them in different ways. Um, you don't want to like, I'm going to take magnesium and stop taking my blood pressure meds because, you know, you need to know. We, we have to be able to test, test that stuff. So it's not a contraindication. Um, it's just that it's, you got, you're taking the same thing. You're taking both an herb and a drug for the same issue. And if you chose the herb or supplement correctly, it will impact that. And so anytime we're doing an herb and a drug for the same reason, it has to be monitored in some form or fashion. And in the case of blood pressure, Get a cuff. They got them. There's finger cuffs, and wrist cuffs. And, you know, so you don't even have to like sit there and do the old school pumping up the thing. It's all automated now and it's accurate enough. Um, and I really do encourage people to get one of those and periodically, even if your blood pressure is perfect, you ought to check it at least once a month, especially as we're getting old. Um, we might need to do it more often than that. Thank you. Yeah. Someone said how about cabbage and i'm not sure if that means cabbage related to high blood pressure meds or i i'm assuming so cabbage is an interesting thing because there's like the cabbage weight loss it's a diuretic um boy that's a all right so yay energetics we say <laughs> um when we talk about herbs and when we talk about illness um and ultimately a really cool class that y'all get um is and when we talk about medications they all have energetics. And so we tend to describe everything as hot or cold, wet or dry, uh, deficient or excess or tense or lax. And we can translate that into any system. Um, and so a good example is antibiotics. You know, We say that energetically antibiotics are usually very cold. There's some categories that are a little different. And so what happens is if you take antibiotics, a lot of people get diarrhea. 
uh, they'll get nausea and vomiting, yeast infections. We're basically putting the fire out in our digestive, digestive system and we get literally this purging. Um, and so we can look at an individual. And so like I tend, I'm deficient, uh, tend to be cold and a little wet. So I've always got my sinus issues. Thank you, S Army. Um, and so if I were to take an antibiotic, I'm very likely to have an adverse re uh, event. Somebody has a red tongue, a rapid pulse. They tend to run hot. They're the one going, oh my God, I can't drink enough ice water to crank in the uh, AC down to sub zero. That person is the least likely one to have an adverse event to an antibiotic. So those kinds of things really figure into the mix. So there, there's a long roundabout way why I'm doing that. So cabbage is cold. And so it will increase the uh, urination. But in the case of me, if I did the cabbage soup or a cabbage diet, literally I would have diarrhea for a week. That might lose weight, water weight, but it's gonna just lose everything. Uh, and so cabbage will work, but again, we have to always look at, uh, and I hate to say it, yay, energetics wins. Creating balance in an organism is more important than just purging fluids out. And too often, I, I would argue Western medicine goes chases the symptom. And there's only a few diseases Western medicine cures. They, they will treat symptoms, they'll reduce your blood pressure, but you have to take the medication for the rest of your life. And so they can reduce your cholesterol, but you have to take that medication for the rest of your life. Um, what they don't say is this will make it so you take this for two weeks and antibiotics are a good example, right? If you get a bacterial infection, you take some antibiotics and you're cured. Like, no, that's a freaking miracle. They cure stuff. But too often when we look at that chronic disease, um, they don't cure it, they mask it so it doesn't kill you. Good that it doesn't kill you. Um, so if we're able to use things that don't cause harm, um, like something normal, like celery, uh, and we get behavior changes, stop eating crap, don't go through the drive through uh, go for a walk. Um, if those are things that are possible, because they're not always possible, um, that we may be able to make it so people no longer need their medication. Um, and, and I don't know that, you know, we're never allowed to use the word cure, but where people don't need to take medication and they have no symptoms. <laughs> so that's as close as we get to it. Um, so now, I, I think that's what you meant with that. So um, short term is a, a quick diuretic. I've actually used cabbage leaves on people with mastitis. So cabbage is cold. We put it on a hot thing and it helps. Like that's, a, yeah, dries up breast milk. It, it's like, that's been done for a thousand years and it still works. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's an interesting one, but it really tells us the nature of cabbage. Ice cold, like I love cabbage. Cabbage doesn't love me. Uh, <laughs> There's a doctor online that said yeah. if one chooses to make lifestyle changes, it can often get off of medications. Yeah. It's a partnership. Yes, a hundred percent. And like, that's a good doctor. Get his yes. name. <laughs> Hope you're local. <laughs> no, and that is like that's that's a conversation that's not had very often. And and I, it, it's funny. I get it. Doctors, you know. I might see six patients in a day. Doctors will see, you know, sometimes 20, 30, 40. And I feel the frustration of like, oh my God, just stop eating crap and go for a walk and you'll be fine. And some people won't and medication's good for that. Um, and so I, I always say herbs, medications are either to, is for people who are not willing to make lifestyle changes or until they're able to make uh, the lifestyle changes or enough change to make it so that they don't need one or the other. And so it's like, Hit it hard, they make changes, we taper them both off until we can actually neutralize what we're dealing with so that like just be healthy. Uh, and that homeostasis or balance, depending on which fancy word you like to use. Yes, um, that's not always accurate though, to tell us how it's being utilized in the body. So it's more, um, that's looking at it in solution in the blood and not necessarily like, how is it in the bone or how is it in the muscle tissue? Um, and so there's fancier, less accepted and not um, accepted by your insurance. <laughs> of course, all the really 
detailed tests. Mm -hmm. Your insurance won't pay for it, which, and they're expensive, you know, which sucks. Um, really your simple cause. Yeah, and, and you know, magnesium generally won't kill you, but it may give you diarrhea. So if you take and you're like, yeah, that ain't going to work, then don't do that. <laughs> you can oh yeah good call so there is absorption through the skin so with magnesium sorry and for folks online uh, she asked a question about magnesium whether we can do a blood test for it um and so it's like literally it's a part of the pun a crapshoot um so <laughs> but the topical magnesium does not affect the bowels um, and so we can do anything from an Epsom salt bath is a wonderful way to help with insomnia, just taking that at night. And there's like, yeah, depending on who you ask, 10 to 15% absorption from the skin. So it's a gentle way to get some magnesium and increase in the body. Um, but now they have the gels that you can get at the health food store that are especially good for muscle cramps. So we can do a local absorption. So your muscles are getting the right signaling with that. Um, and uh, again, they usually add uh, interesting things to get a little bit better than uh, the 15 or 20% absorption through those. And so that's a safe way to do it for, um, a safe way to use it for young children and stuff where you're gonna drink that craft, you know, or, or take a pill. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's some really interesting things that there's a number of, uh, methods of getting the absorption to increase exponentially, they totally creep me out and I won't do. But I know, I, I wanna see the science on that. I'll let somebody else experiment on that. You got a, a question that I know you're going to like. Um, <laughs> can you please talk a little bit about statins when you have a chance? <laughs> Trigger warning. Jump on my soapbox. Right. Statins suck. No, <laughs> unless you need them. Um, and I apologize. Let me put that one on hold for a minute. Um, I think I got a slide coming up on that here for long because I can get all ranty on that one. Mm -hmm. um, but let me bust through some, some uh, quality control and talk about that briefly. So within the realm of Chinese herbal medicine, there, there are real issues with quality control. Um, because we use the, the opinion name uh, oftentimes with this, and there is not enough appropriate use of Latin uh, binomials, the you know, genus and species. Um, because we're oftentimes uh, not seeing the herb itself, that we're seeing a powder, powder concentrate, or a pre-made formula, and the quality control of some of the, the pre-made products out of China are horrifying. There's maybe a dozen companies that I'm willing to work with in out of China. Uh, that they're doing appropriate third-party testing and uh, 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 that I feel secure that we're getting what they, they uh, say that we're getting. And not to say that price is a valid means of being like, yes, you can do all the fancy chromatography, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'll talk about that in a second. The reality is it costs money to do good lab testing. So if you're buying a product retail, for more than I can get it for wholesale, I'm going to say that, that company didn't do testing. And I've got a, a fancy book. And Trisha, can you grab me that kind of orange and yellow book there, all the way in the far end next to the tradition sign? Um, that too often I've seen people come in with a product that's mostly written in Chinese. Yeah, on the bottom of that little stack. Yeah. Um, they come in with a, a product and I go I have never seen or heard of this product and it does not follow the oh my god it's so late I gotta go way faster than I am oh thank you um and I asked them how much they paid for it and they got it from the practitioner for five dollars I was like throw that away I actually have a wall of shame somewhere um and I don't know can I can they see that um lift it up higher yeah all right so this is an old book and um you can look up most Chinese patent formulas in this book. Uh, and they, back in the day, Jake Kraken uh, sent a bunch of stuff out to labs and came back with all the lead and arsenic and creepy stuff and adulteration with uh, pharmaceutical drugs that showed up. Um, the opinion name, so when we look at Xuan Mutong and Guan Mutong, like one will cause you kidney failure, one's a really good diuretic. And if it's on the label and they just say Mutong, if you can't trust the company, you don't know which one it is. Um, and there continues to be adulteration in the realm. 
Uh, and so it is important that we only work with companies that we know are doing appropriate testing that are, uh, and they're the major companies, but they cost a little bit more. And, and so uh, if they're meeting the German uh, uh, CGMP, good manufacturing practices, the US, Germany, Australia have the highest standards for good manufacturing pra practices. China, Malaysia, those are the ones I'm going to bother to say, have less than ideal good manufacturing practices. <laughs> um, for practitioners, one of the things I always say is call up your wholesale company where you get your herbs or your supplements from and say, uh, ask for the, C call the company. I was like, hey, you know, I'm thinking of getting an account with you and buying some product. Can you send me a C of A? And that's fancy jargon for certificate of analysis, which means they sent it out for lab testing. If they go, what's a C of A? Just hang up. <laughs> if they go, hey, it's on our website. We do batch testing every three months. Then you go, oh, I like these people, you know, or we'll send it with your first order or whatever. And so that's one of those things where you always want some level of testing. Um, also, the more a product is processed, the easier it is for it to be adulterated. So if I do an alcohol extraction, I've just got this liquid that I'm assuming the plants that are listed on the label are inside of. And maybe I can test, taste them, maybe I can't. If it's a powdered up, I put five different herbs together that all look about the same and you powder them, you're like, I don't know, it looks like a powder. You can maybe taste it, maybe you smell it. So the less processed they are, the easier it is to identify them. And we saw that with Kava Kava back in the 70s. It was banned in a number of countries. Um, in places like Canada, Canada it is still banned um, because we only use the below ground parts of Kava Kava. Really good plant, great anti-anxiety, anti-spasmodic, social beverage, ceremonial beverage, it just kicks butt. Um, but guess what? If it's powdered up and put in a capsule, you don't know. And when there's a lot of money involved at the beginning of the resurgence of herbal medicine uh, it, it, throughout the world, you could harvest the entire plant, grind it up into a powder, and nobody would know until there was an issue. Um, the other thing was if we extract it into a liquid, um, you don't really know and the quality control of the liquids are a little shady sometimes. So one of the things that I'm sorry, I'm gonna to go to the next slide just so I could uh, keep moving along. One of the things that also happened in the seventies was they used a really good solvent to get some super uh, extractions out of Kava Kava. They used acetone. And then they tried to use a little chemical process to try to like push the, the acetone out and then replace it with alcohol or whatever, I don't know. And, and so we had a few issues with that. So we try not to do that anymore. Um, the reality was, it, there was 56 cases, uh, adverse events reported in Europe uh, back in the uh, 80s, I believe it was, early 80s. Um, and the British uh, Herbal Society, the uh, equivalent to our American Herbalist Guild, decided to investigate these specific uh, cases. And I, I'm gonna skip over the page where I talk about this in a minute. And what they found was that there was a number of repeated events. Most of the adverse events were people who were taking massive amounts, amounts beyond what was recommended on the bottle. And if they had like liver, elevated liver enzymes, if they stopped taking it, everything went back to normal. There was one death associated with Kava Kava. And what it was, was there was a car accident. They found a bottle of Kava in the back seat and they blamed that death on the Kava Kava, which if we're going to use that criteria, French fries are killing people every day. <laughs> we better take that off the market. Um, so, you know, we don't have clear criteria. We see that same type of inappropriate science being used for things like Kratom now uh, in an attempt to ban that. And I'm gonna quickly climb off of that soapbox and save that for another lecture. So one of the things as consumers, as herbalists, we have to use what's called organoleptic testing, which is fancy talk, it smells like mint, tastes like mint, must be mint. Um, and the FDA, that is an accepted method of evaluating quality of herbs. So for 
us as herbalists that we taste herbs all day long whenever we have class we're here like here have some flying squirrel poop nibble on that um that you know now that they know what flying squirrel poop looks like smells like and hopefully tastes like not me <laughs> um and so we should be evaluating our herbs as we come in we should open up capsules we should taste them uh and taste our tinctures and hopefully see those things so uh, there are next to zero worthwhile human studies in herbal medicine to test the safety, efficacy, uh, and certainly not herb drug interactions. Most of our studies are in vitro, which are just done in a lab in a test tube on cell tissue, not on living organisms. There's some rat studies and mice and rabbits, which are interesting, a little bit more useful, but honestly, bunny rabbits and people are not the same. Um, how many of you are injecting herbs into your muscles or into your stomach? Anybody? No, no, I don't see any hands going up here. So when you do research, you have to be very precise. How much herb per uh, milligram or gram of body weight or kilogram of body weight so that we can see what's the safe dosage, the LD50. Um, and so we can't put a headlock on a mouse and stuff St. John's wort down their pie hole and think we're going to get an accurate thing. So what do they do? They they inject it. And because at least in the US, there is not a lot of IV or IM, intramuscular injections of herbs. And the mechanism of how our body processes is different if we eat it, and it goes through our digestive tract and our liver and so forth, versus right into our bloodstream, right into our muscles. It's a very different process. And so we get different outcomes when we look at herbs for that. Um, a lot of times because of our languaging, this is a blood mover. We say it's a blood thinner. And so again, remember I talked earlier about languaging as an issue, that's an issue. Um, and I'm gonna talk briefly about my favorite one, echinacea, and, and I'm gonna skip a few things. And by the way, we're gonna send these slides out um, at the end for anybody who registered online. And then we're gonna upload this on YouTube and we'll send the link out to that to everybody when we're done. Um, okay. Probably be Tuesday, but that's besides the point. Um, but uh, so you can see all the slides that I'm going to skip over because it's like, oh my God, there's only like 15 minutes left. Um, so echinacea study a couple of years ago, um, it was one of the largest studies ever done. It was uh, done by a guy who was trying to prove that echinacea worked. And so it was a million dollars, actually it was $2 million. It was 500 uh, test subjects. They were infecting people with influenza virus, literally stuck influenza virus up their nose. Um, and it was, it was a double blind placebo control. And one of the big problems that they had was if you've ever had a liquid extract of echinacea, it is a horrendous and unmistakable flavor to it. So how do we find a placebo that tastes as crappy as echinacea. So they figured out that they, they found something that's just as disgusting as echinacea, Jägermeister. So if you know anything about, I think it's 56 different herbs that are in Jägermeister. It is a medicinally active uh, distillation of it that was like for the plague or something back in the day. And so it wasn't an inert thing. Like it, it's like if they gave chalk to somebody, that would be fine. But the reality was, a, when they did the study, and I'm going to beat the study up some more, they found that placebo and echinacea worked about the same because they're both really medicinally active. Um, the other problem was, so the German E Commission, somewhere I have a copy of it, I won't flash it at y'all, um, is one of the most conservative tomes that was done back in the 70s. It's updated periodically. And if in the German E Commission, it says that a herb works, you can guarantee it works like a champ. That's like a lot of the uh, universal healthcare countries, that's what they use to incorporate herbal medicine in there. So according to the, um, the German E-Commission, you had to do one gram of echinacea three times a day. They used half that dosage. Any herbalist would tell you, you have to do that much every hour or two in order to get it. And that as herbs go, it's mediocre at best for colds and flu. And so the Medicines of the Earth Conference is coming up at the end of this month uh, up in North Carolina. Um, the guy who did this research was the keynote speaker on Saturday night. Uh, and um, this poor guy, he gave this wonderful presentation, ran through the whole thing, was so excited to be at an herb conference. And at the end of it, he's like, and I'm sorry to report that echinacea does nothing. 
And so, you know, if you've ever been to one of these things, they put out like microphones and people are allowed to like line up. There was like a line out the door and we were like ready to lynch this poor guy. And, and he was horrified. He really wanted to prove that echinacea worked. He was sure that herbal medicine was an effective way to deal with any number of different issues. And they didn't have an herbalist to advise them. They had pharmacists and doctors who don't know squat about herbal medicine and how to utilize that as your mainstay for medicine. And so as we read research and we're exposed to research, it's really important that we go to the, the original data. We look at the actual research and not some newspaper reporter who doesn't know anything about herbs either about what it says. I would say, and I've got a couple links at the end that I hate to say it, I didn't check to see if they were still active, but hopefully they are. Um, the reality is most of the websites that talk about herb drug interactions are made by pharmacists and MDs, and there are no zero goose egg herbalists who are usually advising on that. And that's unfortunate. Like, it's not to, like, no, we need MDs and we need chemists and all of that. Like, I don't understand half of that crap. Um, and so, but there ought to be a herbalist. There's somebody who knows stuff about plant medicine that should be participating in that discussion when we're starting to put stuff out there. I'm going to skip the, um, my soapbox rant uh, on all of the media uh, bias to include um, consumer reports, which we think of as a very unbiased thing. They are horrific and horrible yellow journalism when it comes to herbs and supplementation. I don't know what their issue is with it. But it's the one time that, and some of these are very common herbs that they talk about, uh, and I'm gonna skip it. Um, and I'll let you all do your own research on some of these. I will also take one second to rant about um, the horrible thing that we have a medical marijuana bill and not a medical cannabis bill here in Florida. So cannabis is now a, 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 a you're allowed to go to dispensaries and use it for medicine. That's freaking awesome. The term marijuana is a derogatory slang term that when is it that we in a bill, a political thing that is important for the health and well-being that we use, you know, if we go called it the weed bill, would we take it seriously? Marijuana is actually talking about the, it, literally this was from the 30s, that the, the evil Mexicans were going to bring the, this evil drug in and as they got high, they were going to hack and rape and kill and murder, literally like for real. That was what it was. And so marijuana is this horribly racist derogatory term. And it's part of now our political stratum by calling it a medical marijuana bill. I get so twitchy about that every freaking time. It's like <laughs> cannabis, spa. <laughs> Sorry. So let's get down to the meat of it because uh, I only have a few minutes left and I got 4,000 more slides. <laughs> so some things to, to really take into account uh, as both consumers and as practitioners, um, quality control, you get what you pay for. Um, and so really making sure that you're getting the best ingredients that you can, ensuring that they are the ingredients that are listed on there, that you haven't had some crappy substitution. Ideally, if we can get lab tested and organic uh, is a perfect world. Um, making sure that we stay up to date on our knowledge that this is always this information is changing constantly so always do your homework like i i see way too many people who have cancer <laughs> and they'll have a medication that either i haven't seen a lot um or they're it's a new one and they're always new meds i'm like i know what i want to give you i'm going to go do my homework and I'm not going to just throw something at you because I did it before. I wanna make sure there's no research, new research before I start tossing things at people. And so I, I tell my students that I still study two hours every night, pretty much probably five or six days a week. Um, I'm always doing research because there's always new information. Um, and so I, you can't ever sit on your laurels on this. And we would hope that our MDs do the same thing and they do. Like they're, they have to keep up to date with all the current stuff and some are better than others. <laughs> so um, make sure we become uh, familiar with those herbs with potential toxicities. And, and I think that's important. Um, there's great debate about the uh, uh, 
pyrolizidic alkaloids or the aristolotric. Uh, okay, I don't think there's any debate on the aristolotric al alkaloids, but the PAs, uh, it's way easier to say AAs and PAs. Um, as a general rule, I will not give people those herbs internally. The one of great controversy, although I don't think it should be a controversy, is with comfrey. Um, comfrey has been shown to have a cumulative negative effect for fetal occlusive disease, uh, never on infants or pregnant. Um, and so I never uh, give people uh, comfrey internally. Uh, topically, 100% safe. Uh, so don't even think twice about it. Uh, opinions vary on that. I'm going on the science on that one. Uh, also, always use some sort of system of evaluating what herbs to give somebody. It can be medical. That's just as valid as energetic. And all of the energetic systems are just as valid as the others. I tend to use Chinese or Western energetics, but I will totally, you know, go with some medical herbalism in a heartbeat if I think it's appropriate. And so um, as long as you're using a system in order to evaluate um, and come up with an understanding of their imbalance and matching the herbs or formulas to that. Um, that has shown to be the safest approach. <coughs> if somebody is on a narrow therapeutic margin uh, medication, uh, the be careful if we're using an herb and a drug for the same purpose, right? That's the blood pressure herbs, blood pressure meds, diabetes herb, diabetes med. And doesn't mean we can't, just use caution. We need to monitor. Um, make sure you adjust for the uniqueness of the human, not the Google, right? So they're small, large, fast metabolism, slow metabolism, big, large animal, whatever. Um, and then ask, like, if they are able to get pregnant, we should be asking regularly whether or not they are. If they're not using birth control, if there's any risk, um, then we should be there. Just because you saw somebody two years ago and asked them if they were pregnant when you did an intake doesn't mean they're not two years later. And so you should always ask, you know, is anything changed, new medications, any chance that you're pregnant, blah, 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 blah. Um, in a perfect world, and the world is not perfect, you would separate your medications and your herbs by four hours. That decreases your risk. And so, I don't know, I take my share of supplements and I'm lazy. So I take, you know, pre-made formulas a lot of times, a big handful. Well, I'm not on any prescription meds, but if I did to take my prescription, you know, my 20 prescription meds and my 20 supplements all in the same swallow in here, no one has any idea what's going on. And so, you know, there is potentially something that's going to go out of whack. So we can do our best to separate our medications and our herbs. Uh, if we need to, you know, if you have a narrow therapeutic margin medication that you take once a day, get your herbs as far away from that as possible, or your supplements as far away as possible. Um, and to just toss something at somebody and never see them again, especially if they're on medications and taking your supplement, like we need to follow up. We need to constantly monitor because some medications take months in order to take effect. The same is true of herbs. And so what, just because you took it one day and didn't have an interaction, literally three months from now, maybe you will. And so we need to constantly be monitoring or like, I, I, one of the things I was like, when did the symptoms happen? When did you start taking that medication? Um, a good example was because somebody asked a question about, oh, that's basically the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get to the good stuff. Somebody asked about um, statin drugs, cholesterol medications. Sometimes the cholesterol, the adverse reactions to cholesterol med uh, medications happens months uh, after you start taking them, where we get the all over uh, body pain, uh, muscle achiness. It usually starts at the feet, and works its way up. But then we're starting to see some initial research on the statin or cholesterol medications where it increases the risk of diabetes and increases the uh, risk of age-related uh, dementia, memory loss kind of issues. Um, and so like, yeah, if you've got a stint, if you've got major, you may need a statin drug, but you need to then monitor for the side effects. And this is where the good or drug interactions come in. So using coenzyme Q10, CoQ10, uh, also known as ubiquinol because it's ubiquitous in all of your cells of your body. 
Um, this can help uh, counteract some of the side effects of statin drugs. Um, and I'm not gonna read all the rest of those to you, but the reality is this: some of this stuff we know. Take a probiotic with your antibiotics and you'll reduce your risk of yeast infections and mean diarrhea stuff. Um, so some of these, we have seen the practice of it. Sometimes it, it's funny, there's, there's good accepted research. The Mayo Clinic will talk about it. And yet some people don't look like, some MDs don't believe that like probiotics and antibiotics should go together. Uh, it's like, no, read the research, dang it. Um, but I wanna get to some of my favorite stuff. Uh, this was basically the same thing. Sorry, that's a repeat slide. Uh, ooh, I had this cool little fadey thing. Um, you guys can read these on your own later. But this is basically cool stuff. I want to get to the, oh, wait. No, I'm going to talk about this one. Because um, I do have 15 minutes. I can say a lot of crap. And so steroids, <laughs> steroids rock. No, steroids are, will, will keep you from going insane. And they'll also screw you up. So uh, these are steroidal anti-inflammatories, right? As opposed to NSAIDs, non steroidal um, and so things like pregnisone, if you've got like this horrible all over body rash and you're literally tearing your flesh off, you're going to be really happy about those steroids. If you have this, you know, debilitating autoimmune disorder and you get this horrible flare up for any number of different reasons, the steroids will suppress it and allow you to function. And there are so many people who literally are challenged where, you know, when you take steroids, it's like, yay, 20 milligrams of steroids. And then you, over time, you slowly dose off and you get down to that last five milligrams and all of a sudden, oh, and it all flares up again. And they put you on a higher dose, uh, flares up again. And you're on this roller coaster ride that A, may get your house really clean because you're so amped up on the steroids, <laughs> oh, but you also end up with moon face, a horrible weight gain and a, and a trashed immune system. So what I found <clears throat> was there are, things that we can do to make the, and so, or drug interaction, positive or negative, make the steroid last in your body longer. And so we get a slower taper off in that last five milligrams. You guys will get more in class, don't worry. Mm -hmm. I'm going fast. But we can use licorice. Um, the DGL, the deglycerized licorice does not work quite as well. Um, there is a Chinese formula called Shayo Gansao Tang. Um, say that three times fast, uh, that will keep the steroid function in the body longer and you will get a slower taper and you won't get this horrible rebound effect. The downside of licorice is in very high dosages or long-term, it can cause a potassium imbalance in your kidneys and cause elevated blood pressure. So um, we do have steroidal-like herbs. Licorice is probably the most powerful, the most common to use with steroids at that last dosing to have a slower taper. Sarsaparilla, which is a local Florida herb that you know is a uh, greenbrier smilax. It's all over the place. Don't try that one at home unless you're really sure of your plant ID. Uh, but the roots of that has a uh, steroidal-like effect, will slightly increase the uh, life in the body and is specific for inflammatory skin disorders. It's known as sarsaparilla in the islands but there's different plants by the name of sarsaparilla. So it needs to be a Smilax species. <sighs> yeah, we kind of said that. You guys can read that one. <laughs> um, this is, it's super important. We need to work with the MDs on this stuff. Don't try to, don't John Wayne this one. Um, so some of these uh, scarier medications where we're trying to decrease the dosing, like there, there's, MDs are becoming more accepting of crazy alternative stuff. And so make sure that you're finding a doctor who will work with you that doesn't have to be educated in it with it. Like they don't get a good education. Some go out above and beyond. They just have to be going, I'll work with you and let's monitor. They're the um, Cleveland Clinic, which is kind of like the Mayo Clinic, but in Cleveland. Um, and they're very cutting edge. And uh, a number of years ago, they actually brought an acupuncturist and an herbal, actually they brought a, a one and a half herbalist in there. They had a full compounding pharmacy of Chinese herbs and the doctors were referring patients there and they were doing good. It was actually the woman who was leading that project was the acupuncturist uh, that was here in St. Pete. And I think she's back in Clearwater. Um, and they did all of the blood work to make sure kidney and liver function, that there were no herb drug interactions. And what they found was, yeah, sometimes stuff happens. And if you stop taking the medication, it goes back to normal. 
And so being able to do blood work to make sure we're doing no harm, which is all like, nobody wants to get hurt doing this stuff. Um, so like finding a good doctor to work with this stuff is really important. Uh, and, and so they're out there. You just got to look sometimes and uh, hope that they're still taking new patients. So this is what I really like to rant about. So antibiotics will save your life or destroy the world. One of the two. Uh, obviously, the antibiotics are overprescribed, overused. Yeah, right. Um, but if your your appendix bursts, I want some antibiotics. You know, if you've got a red line running up your arm, I want IV antibiotics. Like, no, it's going to save your life. Um, but the overuse of it means that the bacteria are um, surviving. And you know, we had we have MRSA, right? Methicillin resistant uh, uh, bacteria. And now we have super MRSA. And it was, I think just like two years ago, we had the first and uh, first bacterium, I think it was in India, that they did not find a medication that would kill it. Um, and that's horrifying that, you know, and through overuse in the, in the uh, animals and their feed, we like, we handed out like candy and people still like, if you're given a prescription of antibiotics, finish the stupid prescription. I know it's kicking your ass. It doesn't matter. It does. But uh, the reality, if you're like, well, I feel better. So I stopped taking it. That means more of those bacterium survived and are now resistant to the antibiotics. So you're, what you have available to help you, should you get that infection back has been uh, diminished. So this is one of those things where we can use herbal medicine to help prevent bacterial resistance. And sorry, way too much science. Um, yes, you can Google this on PubMed. PubMed is a wonderful place to do research. So there are three ways, primary ways that bacterium create resistance. The e, the efflux pump. The efflux pump is basically um, the poop of the um, of the bacterium. So basically, this, this is the, the way, you know, poison comes in, antibiotic comes in, it poops it out through here. And so the efflux pump literally is saving that bacterium from your antibiotics. Quorum is, you know, like if any of you were on college uh, clubs or something, you would have to get a quorum, you'd have to get an agreement. In this case, the word quorum is more about how bacterium communicate. And I know it's creepy. It's a little like single-celled animal in there doing bad stuff. They literally communicate with each other. And so they're like, hey, these idiots just threw some antibiotics at it. Run, set up your defenses, turn on your efflux pump. So, you know, uh, the Sun Tzu, the art of war, the best way to defeat the enemy is cut down their lines of communication. So if we can shut off the ability of the bacterium to communicate with each other, they're not able to set up their defenses. So, uh, and then the creepiest one is biofilm. Uh, I refer to it as the Klingon cloaking device. So basically they can secrete a mucus. It hides the bacterium from our immune system. Like, so even if you have the best immune system in the world, if it is able to secrete a biofilm, it literally hides from uh, our, our body. So these are the primary ways that Bacteria defeat antibiotics and kick our ass. So turns out that there are many, and this is the short list. Like literally this is the, you know, my quick Google search. <laughs> there are many herbs that can affect uh, shutting down the efflux pump, which is probably the primary thing we can look at. And so some of these are Western, some of these are Chinese. Uh, licorice uh, is pretty common. Anagraphis is growing in its use in the uh, Western uh, Medica. And then dandelion, everybody uses dandelion. It's freaking amazing. And Huanglian, Coptis, anything that contains berberin. And so that can be Oregon grapefruit, that can be golden seal. Don't use golden seal, it's a threatened species. Use Oregon grapefruit um, and lots and lots of other cool stuff. Um, there are, and basically, eh, yeah, I don't have it. Uh, these herbs, this combination is a uh, modern formula in Chinese medicine that does all three. It hits the quorum, it works on biofilms, and it shuts down the efflux pump. And so this can be given with antibiotics. So it's not going to interfere with the function of the antibiotics. They're still going to kick ass. This will make it so that you don't create bacterial resistance because it contains thousands of chemicals whereas the antibiotic is a single chemical and it can create resistance. With this, they can't adapt or adjust to it. Um, 
it's an easy, easy way to just go like, take a probiotic, take this and take your antibiotics and finish the course of treatment. And we can do better medicine, reduce the side effects and prevent the zombie apocalypse from the, yeah, this is basically the same thing. You guys can read that. Um, and we're going to post this on the YouTube channel. We'll set up the link as soon as we get it. But because I didn't know how to do it, because I suck at the internet. Uh, <laughs> if you search for Tradition School of Verbal Studies, I've got way too many of my rants. Uh, and our monthly, the last Friday of every month, I do an open forum where basically I take questions and do my very best to uh, download all of my information, kind of like tonight. Uh, <laughs> so I encourage you either join us live uh, in person, in person here. You can join us live on Facebook or check out all the ones of the past two years, I think, that I've uploaded online, plus lots of little herb walks and, and talks of stuff. Um, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. For herb drug interactions, here's a crap ton of not just herb drug interaction stuff. This is also really good resources for herbalists, um, for medical professionals, and so forth. I encourage all of you who have an interest in herbal medicine, whether you're a beginner uh, in the realm or somebody further along, the American Herbalist Guild is our professional organization, and they exist kind of to make sure that we're all smarter. And anytime you read really crappy things about herbs and you're like, that doesn't sound right, I encourage you to check out the um, herbalgram.org. Um, that is the American Botanical Council. And they're kind of our organization that keeps watch over people slandering our stuff. It is a wonderful place to do research. They have uh, varying levels to like, I didn't pay anything to pay more. And you can get all kinds of good uh, access to PubMed. Every time there's a study that comes out, like all the crap in New York, where they're like, the plants aren't actually in here. They basically said they're idiots, that they don't know basic science, that they were looking at extractions and trying to find DNA when you won't find DNA if it's an extract. And they lost that argument because all the companies said it's easier to stop doing it than actually fight the government. Um, so you can usually find a very well thought out. There are um, dozens uh, of scientists, PhD, MDs who are on their advisory board there who are able to go through the raw data and say, stupid heads or no, be careful with that crap. That shit will kill you. Um, and a bunch of other websites there. Um, my favorite book. Ah. There it is. If I, I like paper, so I this is uh, more Western than anything. It also, this book, and sorry, I don't know if you can read this, it's Herbal Contraindications and Drug Interactions Plus Herbal Adjuncts uh, with Medicines by Francis Brinker. He's a hoot. Uh, if I had more time, I'd tell bad uh, uh, stories of me teaching with him. Um, but this is all research based. So if you look in here, he will give you a link to the research and will tell you whether it's actually in, by mouth, by injection, total conjecture and so forth. So you can make your own judgments. It will also, I love, I'm hoping it comes out with a new edition because every time he prints one, it gets better and better. Uh, but he talks about the nutritional deficiencies caused by medications and the herbs or supplements you can use to uh, correct the, um, the screwed up in this. Um, and there's a number of others that I find less helpful, but they do have like Jonathan Tresher. I have a lot of respect for, um, this one's a decent one. This is herb nutrient and drug interactions, clinical implications and therapeutic strategies. They got some good stuff. And for folks who are looking for, uh, information about our local plants and the Caribbean, Central South America, uh, and, and I have no stock in any of these, uh, the Healing Powers of Rainforest Herbs, their online resource is phenomenal and periodically updated. At the end of each plant that they have there, they have links to the research and clinical, current clinical trials that are in there. <gasps> question online that's not going to take a second of a minute, but it's a good one. Um, if herbalists are creating their own formulas, for example, with six to 10 herbs, how might they know if using a certain herb would likely be totally safe as a small part of a formula, say at one ninth or one eighteenth part, 
relative to use of the, the herb as a simple whole form or standardized extract of the herb. The <laughs> literature says uh, safe to someone of a certain condition. Good question. Yes. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> um, so the long and the short of it is if you are if you are creating, if you're doing a custom formula and basing it on an energetic system of how this unique individual is presenting to you, um, you are very likely not to have an adverse event. Always when there, especially, you know, like Tabitha, I think you said you had somebody on 30 some odd medications, like, oh my God, that's horrifying. <laughs> and, and so how do we ascertain? Start at a subclinical dosage and slowly titrate up to your therapeutic dosing, monitor, monitoring for adverse events. I also would suggest that you have any, uh, and in the links there, I also had on a couple of those websites, like I think it's rx.com. You can plug in all of the medications and it will put out, uh, it, basically it's a variation of what the pharmacist use. It will put out any potential um, uh, adverse drug, drug interactions. And I hate to say it, when I have somebody with like 10 plus, I usually do that because I don't know enough about all of those. Um, and I will print it out and have them take that to their doctor or pharmacist to ensure that that's appropriately monitored. But if you titrate up slowly, watch for adverse events. And I would encourage, again, this is working with your MD, get blood work, check your liver function, uh, monitor your uh, liver and kidney function is the biggies. Um, make sure you're testing your blood sugar, monitoring your blood pressure that, you, you know, herbs do stuff. And so that can be uh, positive or negative. So as long as we're monitoring, you slowly titrate up, I consider it safe. I've been doing this formally for over 20 years. I don't believe I've ever seen an adverse drug event in my uh, patients. And because I'm super cautious, um, for any of you who are like acupuncturists, uh, I know in acupuncture school, they go, no, you can't, if you're doing a patent formula, and, and I usually will use a patent formula, pre-made formula uh, in a pill form when somebody's on a crap ton of medications. It's, then I know there's like, I, it, in, with companies I trust, um, the schools will tell you, no, you have to double whatever the bottle dosage is. If you get the right formula because your diagnostic skills are appropriate, I usually do half the bottle dosage and get success. So bottle dosage is usually two pills, three times a day. The schools will usually tell you you need to do four or five, three or four times a day. I usually do one or two twice a day and get good outcomes. And so it literally, the better we are at our ability to evaluate the imbalances of somebody, the more we stay within a system and we are extra cautious and monitor every few weeks and back that crap up with a doctor who's going to maybe every three to six months order blood work to check on kidney and liver function, you'll be fine. You know, and watch out for those narrow therapeutic margin stuff. The reality is, I don't, I mean, I always think about it, but I don't think too hard. And we just do our very best um, and be careful with what you're doing. And if there's any hint of an adverse reaction, you stop. He's like, just stop taking it. And I get a phone call and they're like, and I hate to say it, usually when somebody's like, oh my God, I just started getting diarrhea, uh, uh, diarrhea and vomiting, and I have them on something like astragalus, um, it's usually not the herb, it's usually the street sushi they just got. Um, and so we have to sometimes reevaluate what, what is the actual trigger for that. And it's a little scary to re-challenge with the herb after the belly settles down. Um, usually it's something we hadn't thought of. Like, uh, for those of you who are in Chinese, there's uh, unprepared Romania and there's prepared Romania. There are trace amounts of gluten in Shu Di Huang, uh, the prepared Romania. So somebody that has a hidden gluten sensitivity or gluten allergy, uh, celiac disease, will respond horribly to that. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the latex. Like, oh my God, who thought that we had to evaluate that? Or there's a nightshade, ashwagandha is a nightshade. So if somebody has a nightshade, say, holy crap. So we have to be little detectives. 
um, and sort through things um, and look at quality control, look at adulteration. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to stay here and answer any questions if anybody has some because they're already awesome questions, but I'm going to let people escape. Um, please follow us on all the various places, follow us on YouTube and watch for this in your inbox that we will send you a link probably Tuesday. Thank you all for showing up online, all 4 billion of you. <laughs> and for those of you who showed up in person, of course, and please take a papaya if you're one of the cool people who are here in person <laughs> and enjoy them. Um, for people that are staying, if you yeah. are wanting to answer more questions, they're basically asking, do you have a favorite resource for herb drug interactions? Because they're finding discrepancies between WebMD and drugs.com. Yeah. I, I was going to say, as far as I know, I haven't checked recently, but WebMD, um, Rx.com, they don't have an herbalist as an advisor on their websites. And so they literally, they're making crap up. That, and that's a sad, sad statement because no, it's science. No, it's not. Um, that is science. And you can make your own judgments with this book. It is, it is without a doubt. You can find it on Amazon. You don't, I, I'm not selling it. I don't get a percent. Unless you buy it through the website, then I get a percentage. Do it. Uh, <laughs> I get a $20 check every couple of months. Higher. There we go. Um, and I think this guy is brilliant. Um, he, he's, he, he's super smart. And he's obviously put a lot into this book. Uh, and you can get ooh, I'm gonna, on the back. I don't know if anybody, can you see that web address on the bottom? Uh, er? No, but I'll type it into the okay. comments. Uh, here. So okay. he does free updates on his book online. Um, so he is on this crap. Uh, so he's all over it. So I really, when I'm looking at a website that's, you know, and there's a million of them out there that are, are saying, you know, herb drug interactions, I want to see a herbalist. I want to see somebody there who knows herb stuff. And if they're not, then they're literally just Googling crap. You know, we, we kind of buzzed over plantain. Plantain, not the banana, but the weed that grows in your yard. Plantago, uh, Plantago officinalis. There's lots of other ones. Um, it, is a, it, it is a cooked green. It is a phenomenal internal herb. It's a phenomenal topical herb. Probably one of the safest herbs. It's, it's as safe as lettuce. Um, and and or more efficacy than lettuce. Um, and because in the 1970s, that was a day or two ago, um, somebody who was a really bad wild crafter accidentally picked germander and mixed it in with his batch of uh, uh, plantain. Germander is poison. So guess what? Nobody checked it. They weren't doing chromatography, fancy testing. And, and I never really said it, but chromatography, and there's many different types, is like if you ever watch like NCIS and Abby's in the lab and you see this little squiggly line that comes out and she goes, look, it was the blue ring octopus that killed them. That's chromatography. Uh, and so we, we make sure that the right plant is in there. They weren't really doing that back in the day. And, and so um, you will still find reference that plantain is dangerous and will kill you. You'll see that on Consumer Reports, probably WebMD. It was 50 freaking years ago. <laughs> Give me a break. And it hasn't happened since. And, you know, and that's about making sure that you're working with companies that are doing good checks, uh, that they're, they're, they're sending it out for independent lab testing. It, it's funny, like we've got Kratom at the clinic that we sell and um, the suppliers we buy it from uh, so everything out of Malaysia gets testing. It's such a lie. Nobody's testing that crap. And, and so the suppliers we get it from here in the U.S. send it out for independent lab testing that they'll show us the, the uh, certificate analysis. And you know what? I don't trust any of them. We batch test that stuff too and send it out to a lab test. And it's really easy to do um, uh, testing for like yeast bacteria fungus. That's like 50 bucks, but to send it out for like heavy metals and pesticides and stuff, that actually starts to get a couple of hundred bucks. I don't care. I don't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. So periodically we have to send that stuff out to the lab and get it tested um, because the potential for adulteration is there. And if we want herbal medicine to be respected as a potential benefit to work alongside or as adjunct uh, with Western medicine, we have to ensure the most basic things of safety. Um, and you know, if we start there, the herb is what I say it is, 
right? It is plantain, not germander. The, we harvested the right part of the kava kava plant, not the aerial parts, but only the below ground parts that if it has to be processed, it's processed safely. And um, then it gets a lot easier. You know, we start there and then we just do some basic, let's treat what we see kind of thing. Notice the inner imbalances. For those of you who are like self-care, I totally encourage you all, like work with an herbalist. You don't have to see me. You don't have to see our students. Come see our students. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you don't know it, our, our senior students, both Western and Chinese, uh, are seeing clients uh, three nights a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights. Make an appointment. They're supervised by me or one of the other senior herbalists. It's 10 bucks for a consult plus the cost of the herbs, which usually isn't very much. Um, but like, if some of you aren't from around, some of you ain't from around here. Um, but like, there's an herbalist near you. Some herbalists work online. So, uh, you know, reach out, find some folks. The American Herbalist Guild is a wonderful resource, uh, really good information. It's worth the price of admission. And they have free webinars all the time that are uh, better than what I just did. So um, I encourage you all to do more than just a quick Google search and don't trust um, sources like, I hate to say it, like buy now, buy today. Um, you know, they have a vested interest in selling you a product. Do your homework. Um, don't trust any of this. <laughs> it's all a conspiracy. No. <laughs> I know there's 20 more questions in there. <laughs> something about making appointments for students. Mm. Someone's asking, is there any resource or database for drug nutrient interactions? I literally, I, um, uh, drug nutrient interactions um the oh, this one is probably i i do have a lot of respect for this one um the herb nutrient and drug interactions clinical implications and therapeutic strategies um i i personally know jonathan treasure and he's a hoot but he's a super smart geeky good researcher dude um, so that would be my go-to for that. And there is some of that in Francis Brinker's information. Yeah, G, you had a question. <laughs> G, you had a question? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so I've tried to understand this a bunch of times. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Certification analysis of oh yeah, C of A. Yeah. yeah. They a lot of times they're measuring things in parts of yeah. Explain parts from million to me. It's kind of really minute. So the question was like, what about the, when you get a certificate of analysis at C of A, where it says parts per million or billion or uh, whatever? So basically, there there are trace amounts of stuff we don't like in everything, uh, and so you know. And I said like, German Germany has the best standards and you know Timbuktu has horrible standards and the U.S. is kind of middle of the road so each country sets its standards of what it considers the safe limits of every creepy substance out there and you, you may have noticed like in California you always get the uh, California prop whatever the heck number it is 65 yeah I don't know. this product may cause cancer it's like it's water how am I, you know <laughs> And the reality is they have a really high standard, like they don't allow any amount of anything. And, and if you were to see what amounts of certain things uh, were allowed in your food, you would be horrified. There's a certain amount of cockroach legs that are allowed in you know, baby food and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of like, and, and so we, we have the minimum standard, which is a shitty standard. <laughs> And we want better than minimum, right? We want an A plus on that test, not a C minus. And so literally for, let's say in a gram, if you're allowed 10 parts per. So if we divided that into a million slices, you could only have eh, much. So you want basically the lowest conceivable number on there. Um, if it says like, there's one, one billionth of a piece of arsenic in it, like it don't okay. you eat an apple, you'll get that much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I compare it to like, okay, the kale probably has more of this right. metal and, in it. And, and, and that's, you know, so everything organic, biodynamic, literally lithium is in our soil. And all, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that is naturally occurring in, in our stuff. And some of it we need. Lithium will kill you. 
It's also a prescription medication for bipolar and some other uh, mental health issues. And it's funny, I think they found like some uh, groundwater, like a well um, of naturally occurring water. And I want to say it was in Texas, but somebody feel free to correct me on that because that's vague memory. That one of the higher amounts of naturally occurring lithium in the water, lowest murder rate in town. Like in the country, it was the lowest murder rate because like everybody's like, no, we're like, so, you know, we're putting fluoride in the water. We need to be putting some lithium in the water for all of us. Right. And, and so it's, uh, it's, it's not that we should look at the specific numbers. We should make sure that whatever products we're buying is familiar with this. And, and the, you know, if you're making a custom formula at the clinic, uh, like you're not going to send out that product and that's a longer conversation you'll get in class i promise mm -hmm. um uh, you're not going to send that product out for lab testing for a certificate of analysis for the one two ounce tincture bottle you just made for somebody um but we expect our companies that we're purchasing that stuff from who are buying literally connex and train loads of you know metals or whatever um and we go on assumption that organically grown has a safety perimeter, but there's crap in the soil that may or may not be good. So um, I, I always like to think that the, yay, it was the USDA, I guess, that dumbed down our, our organic standard to the point of, yay, Walmart has tons of organics now, which have been shown not to be so organic sometimes, not what we would collect. So looking for biodynamic, you know, like I grow my plants organically, I don't use any chemical pesticides, but I can't afford, afford the five grand to buy the USDA seal of approval. So sometimes knowing your farmers is also good. Uh, you know, it's funny, we get uh, a lot of stuff from Oshala Farms and like we literally gather around the box like it's Christmas when we open it because it smell is just amazing what we get from them. It's like, I don't care what anything says, that's the best product we can buy, you know? And, and so it, it is fun when we're able to do stuff like that, you know, that, Organoleptic testing is just as important as that certificate of analysis. Yeah. All right, I see more questions. It's uh, just me typing in. Books. Oh, uh, <laughs> do you know milk thistle interacting with any drugs? Um, milk thistle. Ah, I'm slick that way. <laughs> I don't accept, and I'm going to say it may very well. Um, all of your thistles, and I will say artichoke being a thistle, if you didn't know that, artichoke, yummy as it may be, is therapeutically active. It is the flower of a thistle plant, are very bitter in their nature. They're protective of the liver. They're anti-inflammatory. They're cooling energetically. And so they, I would say potentially milk thistle may in higher amounts interact with narrow the therapeutic margin uh, drugs. Um, does that mean you should never, you know, eat artichoke? Screw that, it's good. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I actually regularly prescribe to people eat more artichoke. Um, but I would say that like, no, a really common one, very protective of the liver, without a doubt, it has many, many benefits. With most medications, I wouldn't think twice about it. Chemotherapy, I do my homework on that. Like I don't, I, and all of that said, I actually rarely, except for people who are forced long-term to do very uh, hepatotoxic medications or uh, are exposed to a lot of hepatic toxics. You're in a dye factory, you're you know, processing cow hides or something, or you're an alcoholic, um, then which case I do recommend milk thistle. Uh, but for the short period of time that we need to go through chemotherapy, I would probably discourage it if it was my patient. And I can't read that. Big one that's on there. Yeah, I still didn't see the milk test so a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm slick that way. It's right. With polypharmacy cases, the people on 10, 15, 20 plus drugs are horrifying. I've, I've heard that cumulative damages and impairment caused to the mitochondria makes the starting condition such that it makes natural remedies not work as well. That's your experience. Um, yes, without a doubt, it screws up a perfectly good uh, cell. I actually find that the herbs still work. Uh, and, but it, it is one of the, the challenges, 
you know, I, I encourage, like I don't use Western medicine or science to evaluate my clients except for blood work itself. And I encourage like B12 and full iron testing and uh, full thyroid panels and all kinds of good stuff, the usual CBC, CMP. Um, Cause that's the information I can't get. But when we start to look at the cellular level, we look at the uh, citric acid cycle and all the other cool cycles. If you actually start to look at it, it, it is almost absurd to think that we actually understand it. I am awed by the scientists who look at the minutia of those, but like literally go and Google and look at citric acid cycle. And there's like a whole bunch of other cycles besides that. And then find the most pot of spaghetti looking chart of it. And you're like, yeah, nobody knows what the hell that is. Mm -hmm. And so yes, mitochondrial function and uh, the two stage detoxification process that's in the liver and all the reception site receptor sites and all that matters. But I find that even in the case of a polypharmacy where you're talking the 20, 30 medications, if we used an energetic system, one older than science, um, we actually see improvement in outcomes uh, and to the point where we can start working with that MD to peel off some of those medications. Um, so I find even in those absurd cases of 20, 30 medications, those people can recover. It takes time. Uh, it takes years. Um, and it requires change on their part through diet and lifestyle as well. I can't read the next one. Yeah, <laughs> I know. These are not easy. No, these are actually, these are great questions, y'all. I appreciate it. Basically saying, um, if people are highly sensitive to everything, do you start with one drop dose of an herb and then add? That's, that's a, reach so it's super challenging um, when folks have like, literally, like, I'm not, I'm not making a joke. I'm not exaggerating that they have an allergic reaction or a sensitivity to water, um, that, that literally a glass of water will send them into sweats, hives, blah, blah, blah. Um, those are some of the most challenging cases without a doubt. Um, I usually start by taking away most of their supplements, uh, and investigating, um, uh, and, and Man, I've had my share of those folks um, and they're super challenging. Uh, I'll frequently start with something safe, um, something like stinging nettles. That's going to be an anti-antihistamine um, uh, like property and nourishing. Most folks, you know, it's funny, we're the most fed, we have more access to food in our nation and in many you know, first world nations, and yet we're all starving. Um, and whether it is the jacked up digestive systems that, that we've got from any number of different reasons to the nutritional deficiencies um, and, you know, the gut permeability issues from the overuse of antibiotics and NSAIDs and other things. So usually when we're looking at those really bad reactions, it, it becomes, you have to be um, Sherlock Holmes and house kind of wrapped into one and usually it's about nourishment and ensuring that people get nourished most of all and we can uh, look at the FODMAP diets and so forth but even in those cases like sometimes we have to go kind of extreme in those things uh, so there's I wish I could say there's an easy answer for that um, but start small and know that you're going to hit lots of roadblocks I I know for the folks that are challenged by like literally uh, reactions to water um, as a practitioner, and I find it's important to go, I don't have all the answers, um, cause I wish I did. And, you know, I stand up here and go, I know stuff. Yay. Um, the reality is people are so unique and the folks who are turning to alternative medicine and herbal medicine, supplements, functional medicine, and all of that, they are at their wit's end. They've been failed by every institution and to include herbalists, um, you know, not everybody has parasites, not everybody needs a cleanse. Most people are starving. You cleanse them, they're more deficient. Most people are, are, are depleted and exhausted and they need to be nourished. Um, if we let people know that we're going to hit dead ends, we're going to mess up and that we have not just plan A, but we got plan A through Z and that we'll adjust back up and take a new tact and that it is a partnership of solving the mystery 
to try to create, you know, uh, patching people up so that they can get on that road to recovery. And that is about the partnership, not just with the herbalist and, and the client, but also with their MD um, so that we can see whether they're getting better. Like, I want you to see the GI doc. I want you to see the rheumatologist and blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, we don't need it, but it's good to say, like, are we doing a good job? And uh, that, you know, and sometimes like, I wish I could say, yes, I have a hundred percent success rate. I'd be lying. And anybody who tells you that they're lying too. Uh, <laughs> nobody does. Um, we, we haven't cured everything in sometimes somebody else needs to be able to come at it from a different tack that I didn't see. Uh, which thread do we pull on? Um, and if I don't pull on the right thread, uh, then, you know, somebody else is going to pull on the right one. So it's sometimes like if you come to a dead end where the person's just throwing up their hands, try somebody else. Don't give up. Um, one of my, you know, every herbalist, I'm no different from anybody else that we, we get our, sink our teeth into the new idea. And like for the last five or six years, I have been fanatical about low stomach acid. So everybody's got low stomach acid. Everybody needs HCL. They don't, but, um, it, it is one of those things where I'm seeing it in, as our stress level as society increases. And we look at the sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system. Um, when we look at our vagal tone, you can Google all of these, don't worry, um, that it will shut down many of our systems and that, that never ending stress of our society. And, you know, it's the 24 hour news uh, stream and everything else that that's what's screwing us up and we can't do a blood test to test that. And so hence the frustration It's like, I'm doing everything right. Why am I not getting better? Um, and sometimes we literally can't absorb a single thing. Uh, and Literally, when I see people who are getting reactions to water, it's usually low HCL. Is that it? All right. I'm going to let you escape. Poor Trisha needs to go home. She has a child. <laughs> <laughs> he can feed himself. The hell with it. So um, I could use this as an excuse for 30 more years. Totally, right? <laughs> um, so thank you all for tuning in online, for showing up in person. I hope I see you in stuff. Check out our websites, Acupuncture Herbal Therapies, Tradition School of Herbal Studies, St. Pete, Florida. I know you all from all over freaking place. And watch your, if you don't get an email by Wednesday, hassle Trisha. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Bye. How do we stop the madness? Stop share. Ah. I just feel guilty. End. End. <laughs> End. <laughs>